Hey, what's going on, YouTube? It's the brain of the mainframe here now. Scott with Pop XP. And we got a crazy night, oh. fellas. True that. Crazy True that. night. I'm pumped about this. Me too, yeah, dude. I'm Me too. too. Are you pumped, bro? Yeah, I'm hoping that if we uh, if we say Todd Father enough times, he might be like Candyman and show up. Holy Todd crap. Father. Imagine, Todd dude. Father. Todd Father. <laughs> Who's Todd? Todd. Todd. How does our, guest, our our fake guest of honor, man? And everyone's like, Todd's going to be on the show. <laughs> we tricked you. I just we tricked you I think, all. I think we have, a, we have a, we're going to do uh, some Todd specials, aren't we, Niall? We have another one lined up. One of our favorite guys in the industry. Yeah, I will. I'll announce that at the end of the show. Oh, all right. That just, that just popped up. Just freaking just, just fell in our lap like a little feather. From a from a generous bird passing by, just flew like, right into uh, right into my hands. It was unbelievable. Oh, we got, got a great night, man. We got a great night. Uh, we, we got, got a great night. We got some great guests here. Um, great guests uh, talking about, like I said, one of our favorite people, a, a giant of the industry, an icon, uh, the person who just might be personally responsible for me getting back into comics. And I'll really? tell that story. Yep, into comics. Uh, really? In, yep, in 1988. And uh, but just someone who's just always been one of, one of the good guys, do it right, doesn't take shit from anybody, uh, is his own person, and uh, a true leader, a true gentleman, and uh, just just that I gotta tell you, man, that that uh, documentary got me all pumped up, got me. Uh, it was great, right? That yeah, I, did. I went that down memory lane documentary. and stuff, and it was it was it was really cool. Really, I mean, let's talk. I think though we should introduce you know to our guests who we have tonight. You know, they're no strangers to the show, and uh, you know they were there firsthand. You know, with this gentleman at times. So without further ado, let's welcome Bo Smith and Dan Fraga, Mister Fraga Boom himself. Boom. What? Up? what? what? Money suit. Wasn't he wearing a bunny suit and Elvis yeah. glasses the last time? Yeah, I certainly <laughs> was. I certainly was. He's it's got the moon lighting, man. It's called integrity. You see his mood lighting too. Hey, Bo. You hey. see a man's mood lighting? He could change that lighting back then. You want to? You have a particular color you'd like, guys? I can. Well, you no, know, I'm taking the purple, and I'll tell you why. It's yeah. like a pinky Easter eggy purple. Sure. <laughs> there, so there. Easter egg walls and the bunny suit. I'm I'm digging the springtime vibe. Oh yeah, back when things were normal. How are you? Can you hear us, Bo? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, no, not again. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Wink if she has you trapped, Bo. I just didn't hear Bo. I just didn't hear Bo. So that was. Yeah. I'm old, guys. I'm old. Oh, Lee, Lee did <laughs> first said I bad mouth bourbon. I didn't bad mouth it. It's just too sweet for me. Right? Bourbon's sweet. I just remember that bourbon I had the other How night. How can something be too sweet for someone so <clears throat> See, I love this guy. I love him since he was a kid. Since a little baby. <gasps> Dude, I didn't load up the video. Should I step away for a minute and load up the video? Not what we were talking about. Which which video? There's the so video many I was of them. telling you about. Oh, I load it up. Share it. I got a video of Dan Fraga from 25 years ago. No, you don't. What? Yes, I do. Uh -oh. Dan after Jim uh -oh. Lee. Uh -oh. what? what? I don't believe it. No. I'm gonna go get. I'm gonna step out. Did you send that to me? Did I you did send it? I will load it up. I will find it right now and I will load it up. Wow. Oh, <laughs> Bye, everybody. Nice. I blew that. I blew Bye, that on YouTube. See, Bye, I texted you a message or I texted you. Billy, is that your daughter? Your message? Oh, look at that. The Canadian asked if that's my daughter. Aww. Aww, Aww. Sweet Aww. Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> we love our neighbors to the north. Yeah, North yeah. America's hat. Debbie likes to call Canada. That's the first so what place did you ever say? had a America's beer. hat. Yeah, America's hat. That. Hey, That's gonna be a new meme by Brian Blevins. And I, it'll be Debbie. Go out, I gotta go get that. I'll be right back. Did you send that to me, Billy? No, I. Never, I oh, I'll you never ended up. On YouTube, right? Should I load up on YouTube and queue it up or something? Oh, I don't. You can just share your screen, oh. bro. All right, all right. Give me a second. We're gonna, hey Dan, we're gonna start a, we're gonna start a, a episode, a special episode series with Nile where we sing the whole, oh, gosh. the whole show, and we're gonna call it Scala Land. <laughs> His name is Scala. What awesome. I like day. it. I think it's a great idea, and I'm loving the way his mustache is coming in. Last time I was on the show, it was, uh, you know, a little shadowy, and now it, mm. it, it he looks like he's ready for mm. some. Uh, Early 80s I just trimmed television. it up, man. Yeah, it looks good. I just trimmed it up. 
throwing yeah. that flavor oh. saver. I just watched a movie uh, last Annihilation. Night I hadn't seen since it was in the theater. It was uh, the There Will Be Blood. You guys oh, yeah. see that? Yeah. yeah. Man, I mean, that was 13 years ago when I saw it. And uh, I, di- I guess I just didn't pick up all the nuances like around this time, man. So good. Such a, 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 a great um, illustration of, of uh, capitalism, you know, at its mm-hmm. worst. Speaking of capitalism, how did you meet Todd McFarlane? Uh, the first time I ever met Todd? Yeah. Uh, it was August of 89. Uh, He's doing a signing in San Jose. And uh, I've always been this this. I don't know if it if it boils down to like maybe I have uh, some social issues, but like he had this long line, and in my head, I was looking at the people in line, and they all had these comics to be signed, and I wasn't there to get a comic signed. I was there to talk to him because I wanted to ask him about art. So I didn't even wait in line. I literally walked past the line and walked up to him and started talking to him. Um, and he was nice. He gave me some kind words and, and all that. But uh, in hindsight, I, I probably should have waited in line. But, um, yeah. Oh, Michael Green. How Michael are you, man? <laughs> I saw we had the duo of Bo and Dan on here. I had to drop in for a minute. We'll have to watch the whole thing later. Huge Berserkers fan He's here. Not there just we go. a huge Berserkers fan. I would go as far as saying he is the number one Berserkers <laughs> fan. <laughs> no joke. Oh, that's great. That's, yeah. that's excellent. I've still got the uh, previews cover and the poster framed upstairs in my office because we awesome. made, you know, Diamonds Freeview. We were the cover. And, I know. Uh, that was, Every that time was, I see uh, that, I want to fix the drawing on it, though. It's weird. That was my first and only uh, previews <laughs> cover, so I, it meant a lot to me. I've still got that up there. Okay. That's one well, more than I have, though. So are you gonna <laughs> you gonna steal it from them and redo it? No, 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 no. You gotta. I mean, what, you gotta keep things with with put your uh, hand in the camera. all the blemishes and just things. hand me my coffee. But uh, yes, yeah, this is next... my wife's hand. Oh, that's I read, awesome. see. I'm, I do like girls. Ha <laughs> ha! You all didn't believe me. <laughs> Did you know that America runs on Duncan? That's what I heard. That's what I heard. It's we not have... sponsored. It's not we... sponsored by it, but we no, have... it's sponsored by Sea Geek. Sea yeah, we. Geek. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. We so, didn't have Duncan in California for a long time, so it wasn't until the East Coast that I got to enjoy the Duncan coffee. Um, but the, yeah, the the next time I was uh, around McFarland in any sort of capacity is in February of '92 when um, Image had started. I was visiting the the then Extreme Studios, uh, and all seven founders had come, and CNN had come to. Uh, do the whole report on these guys who had left Marvel to form image and Todd was there and I got to spend a bit of time with him uh, Mm -hmm. there. But uh, I mean, long history. I mean, shoot, like I think about that, that was like 30, 31 years ago when I first met him. It's hard to believe. It is hard to believe. I don't even feel like like I'm 31. (laughs) Yeah. What about you, Bo? What was your first uh, experience with Todd? Um, Yeah, I knew of him because he was doing work at Marvel and I was uh, the VP of marketing and writing at Eclipse comics at the time. And uh, it was probably 90, 91. We did famous comic book creator trading cards. And I headed that up as far as the talent. Um, Dean Mullaney, the publisher said, you know, we need to get this list of people, this list of people, and then give me another list of people. So I did and it was my job to contact everybody to ask them to be a part of it. I think we back then, you know, we paid them $25 to do it. You got, a, you know, a set of the cards. You got a bunch of the cards, the boxes mm-hmm. and things like that. And I did not have any uh, introduction or anything to Todd before. I had his phone number. I'd never met him, talked to him. So I called him up and we probably, that first phone call, and I've got all this stuff written down because I keep, I, I write all the time. I've always mm-hmm. kept track of everything in books. And uh, I had that down in the appointment book at the time. We talked probably two hours that first day. And what it, we ended up talking about comics. We talked about sports. 
We talked about hockey. We talked about everything. I mean, under the sun. And no doubt he was probably inking at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he was just doing that. But uh, that was my first conversation with him. And he ended up questioning me more than I questioned him. I mean, he was all for the card set. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm for the independent comics. I'm for the creator. Let, let's do this. It sounds like fun. And, you know, he loves ball cards and stuff. He goes, you know, I've got a, I've got a special thing planned for my card. And I said, great. But he ended up questioning me more that day about distribution, about retail, about how things work. Uh, and at that time was like Dan had already referenced to, they were getting ready. They were break. They had broken away from Marvel and they had a, an engagement with Malibu comics at the time to do their stuff, but they were eventually pretty quickly wanting to break mm -hmm. out on their own, be image comics standalone. So it was a lot of questions on that. So we ended up having a lot of conversations on the phone after that and it broke down into distribution, retail, uh, marketing of uh, a company, things like that. And we, we, we shared a lot of information. I gave him as much as possible. And this is about 91. I would guess. And uh, long story short, um, when it came time when they did break away and we had a couple of owners meetings that I was a part of back then at Anaheim. And in fact, in one of them, uh, this sidebars into a Jim Lee story, uh, Danny Mickey had brought another guy that wanted to ink comics. And Jim told him, you know, they were sitting, he goes, well, I'll tell you what. He goes, I'll give you inking work, but you got to pin me. And Jim wrestled in high school. And uh, the guy was kind of like, oh, what? You know, wrestle you, pin you, <laughs> Jim Lee, you know. Jim Lee was a big name then, too. I mean, so they ended up wrestling a little bit, and Danny was referee in the thing. And of course, you know, Jim, I can't remember the outcome of it. I think Jim did okay, but uh, he ended up giving him a job. But it was, I knew then, I said, this is going to be fun. This is going to be a little different than what I've been used to and stuff, but uh, it was uh, that, that Todd. I went to work for him part time. I was at mm -hmm. uh, Eclipse, and then Dean O'Kate. He goes, yeah. He goes, if, he, if he'll let us do spogs, pogs, spawn pogs. He goes, you can have half his time, and uh, we did. We did the pogs and, and such. But that's where it started. So I basically worked for Todd from about 91 to 2000. Uh, I ended up being his oh, wow. VP of uh, marketing, uh, executive director of publishing. You know, we, we threw around titles like, uh, you know, baseball cards, uh, but the, I was with him that long. Dude, I have a, I have a crazy question. I did not know that. Maybe you can, uh, how come, how come he never went for any of the frills with any of his issues? What do you like, mean frills? Like he never went for the, you know, holographic cover. He never went for the foil lettering. He never went for the, you know, prismatic cover or anything during those times. It was, he was pretty basic about that from the beginning. He goes, you know, it's about the comic book. It's about the character. He goes, I don't really mm -hmm. want to sidebar anybody uh, looking at it speculative. He goes, it's going to sell fine on its own. Yeah. So I'll rather concentrate the on the art and the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having a Todd McFarlane uh, comic is the frill, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I know they did the the coupon, but that was a yeah. you know for Image Zero, but that was like you know Image Wide. Image but, Wide, know, exactly. Had, you know, I mean, again, they had they had trading cards in the bags and boards. You know, Wildcats had that foil mm -hmm. lenticular cover, and, and you know, again, they they started doing all the foil coverings and everything. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about that with Bloodstrike. Yeah. But uh, I was, I was, I had always wondered that. I was wondering why that, like Spawn, never, never did that during that, that time period. Todd was, uh, you know, he's probably the most competitive and driven person mm -hmm. that I personally know. I'm sure it's the same thing you saw the Last Dance with Michael Jordan. You've seen some documentaries with Wayne Gretzky and stuff, and that's something I think I really truly believe Todd shares with those guys is that drive, that competition. And if there's not an outright rival, Todd will make that rival with himself with the motivation and the competition. Mm -hmm. And it's not in a bad way. It's not in a, I'm going to scorch, scorch earth my enemies. It's I'm going to concentrate on what I'm doing, do the very best I can and let my product speak for itself. And he's always been like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I've seen a couple of his, you know, like when he like talks and stuff. And I mean, he does have that presence because like you look at like the CEOs of the big companies, the way they talk, the confidence they have, that kind of no bullshit attitude. Like, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to do what I want. Like this is I know what's right. I'm going to do what's right. I'm not really going to let other people tell me what to do. And that's kind of the, the takeaway I always got from him is like, if you, if you know what you need to do, you do it right. You don't really tell anyone else, you know, tell you what to do, especially when it's your brand, your stuff. I mean, was that something, you know, am I true in, in my interpretation of his speeches and things he does? And if so, is that something you saw, like when you first met him, you're like, oh man, this guy's got something. Oh, uh, definitely. Todd, when, Todd, when I went to work for Todd, there were five of us working. That was it. There was Todd, Terry Fitzgerald, Julia Simmons, Al Simmons, and Todd's wife, Wanda, would come in and out, you know, doing editing and, and, and things like that. And she was, I always said she's the true brains behind the outfit. She was, you know, she's wonderful, uh, wonderful person to know and to, uh, and she is a lot like Todd that this is the goal and this is the way we go. But there were only five of us then. And um, it was neat. And Todd, uh, you know, they talk about the TED Talks. Well, uh, to be honest with you, they were Todd Talks long before they were TED Talks. He was doing this from, you know, he and I would room a lot on the road. And I'd go back into the room in the evening and he'd have 15 to 20 kids, you know, young guys, aspiring comic book artists. I mean, 15 years old, you know, sitting around and he was taking his time and telling them, hey, do this, do that. And it wasn't only how to draw, how to write and things, but how to brand yourself as a business. Don't right. let other people tell you you cannot do this. And he was always great with that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people used to ask me. How come basically Spawn is the only thing he's ever done? Well, I, I'm not speaking for Todd, but I would think in his mind, it's not done yet. You know, I want to mm -hmm. continue to do this. And when it's uh, good and done, it's good and done. And I mean, he he doesn't look at just doing the comic books, which he did for years. But, you know, I can make this into toys. I can make this into a movie. He's done all that. I will never forget when he told me, he goes, yeah, bud, you know, we're going to do why. Uh, we're going to do toys. I'm going to do a toy company. I don't want Mattel. Mattel did his spawn mobile. The very first thing he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, I, I want to do it myself. I see what they've done and I'm going to learn from that, but I'm going to do it. My and part of me in my head, even though I'd been in the business side for a long time, went, eh, we'll see. Yeah. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, too, but bang, he not only did it, but he revolutionized everything. Uh, Mattel used to say, you know, he's going to be out of business. Uh, at first they laughed him off. Then it was, he's going to be out of business in two years, two years. And then we won't have to worry about him because he cannot afford to do this articulation, these paints and these sculpts at this level and charge five ninety eight. you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. The margin is just not there. And Todd not only proved them wrong, but he continued to up the bar. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just business not 101, but business 505 right out of the box. Yeah. Uh, changed the game. Amazing. Changed it completely. Changed the whole game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Game. yeah he's incredible. I, well, he's I not did, afraid to do it. Go ahead, Dan. He's no. not. No, I back in um, late February, early March, I had the uh, the luxury uh, of of having some of Todd's time, and I ended up doing a 106-minute interview with him that I, I recently posted and I, I call it McFarland's rules of success because he, he goes through point by point and breaks down um, what you would think is very obvious, you know, like some of the things that he says are, are very obvious. Like it, as much as I think Todd is um, all of the things you said, he's, he's intelligent, he's driven, he's competitive, but I also think he's very simple. Um, and, 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 and I mean that not in a way of like simple minded, I mean, as in, um, there's that word pithy. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I, I feel like he cuts through everything and distills it down to simple truths. And they're so simple that they become incredibly obvious and he uses them like crayons out of a coloring box mm -hmm. to create masterpieces. Uh, I learned a lot just in that, that you know, hour and 46 minutes with him. Um, he's, he's incredible. And a, a lot of the things that I learned uh, from him when he would come and visit Extreme and give advice,
I've taken with me uh, along my journey. I had the, uh, the happenstance of being directed by him in a toy commercial. I did the, the toy commercial with him back in 95 uh, out in the Arizona heat. Uh, <laughs> but watching him uh, direct, he's, he's very, very good with people. And I think he has probably a, a very high level of empathy as well and understanding what people want because he's, it seems like he's always delivering that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to use this opportunity we've got here with you guys and whoever's watching and who will watch us. Um, the one take of Todd that I'd like everybody to take with them or to know, and this is from experience myself, Todd McFarlane, as my friend and my former employer, is probably one of the best, if not the best, father, husband that I've ever come across. I mean, regardless of what he does for a job, for a living, this, that, and the other, that's always been number one for him and mm -hmm. continues to be. I, uh, you know, I was a father and, and a husband before that. I even took working with Todd in his in cases of something would come up personally and I would go, Todd wouldn't say that or he wouldn't do that. And I don't mean in a hero worship way, but I mean yeah. as an example, as a father and a husband. Mm -hmm. He, you know, nothing else. I mean, that's always been number one. And uh, Dan hit it. He has an empathy with people and maybe doesn't always show it. Everybody gets to see the on stage Todd a lot of times because that's, you know, it's a short period that, of time they've had, but I've got to spend a lot of time and a lot of years with him. And as a father and a husband, it's amazing. It truly is mm -hmm. amazing. And um, if, if nothing else, everybody go, oh, I don't like his art. I don't like it. Hey, you've always got to respect that because it is, uh, trust me, it is number one in his existence. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. And now let me ask you guys a question because I it, I kind of like look at it this way, right? You know, we lost Stanley a couple of years ago. Um, you know, you kind of look at the creators now. It's like who could really take their place? And people name a couple of people, but in my eyes, it's really like you know the Stanley for today, the person that kind of has that drive that makes you like once you're done listening to him talk, like really believe in yourself and what you're capable of, and the and and about the escapism and the stories is, is Todd McFarlane. I mean, do you guys kind of see him as maybe? kind of taking the reins of what, what Stan Lee uh, epitomized while he was here on this planet? I, I see it. I see. It's funny you bring that up because I see that uh, role. It's almost if, if like Stan Lee was like the, this powerful entity that was comprised of a bunch of traits. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, when he left us, maybe they were broken up and went out into different people. Because I definitely believe that Todd embodies a lot of what uh, Stanley embodied. I also feel like Rob Liefeld um, c does the same thing as far mm -hmm. as you know, uh, presenting comics in a very fun way and getting you excited about the history of comics. Um, I'm trying to think of who else is out there. I, I think it's those two guys, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, would you say that Todd was the leader? de facto of image because i know they were all partners and all but like i mean i mean i think from we had uh, eric larson on and it was like eric and and right it was it was eric and rob had the idea right because they were out with um yeah 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 he said that it was like eric and rob and then they got todd in and all this other stuff yeah, but like, was, yeah, you hear the stories it almost seems like todd was the one that pulled everyone no, it was actually yeah i know this is my personal experience in in the history of image the San Diego Comic-Con, 1991, it was the very first year that they had it at the current convention center. Uh, it was my second or third year going to the show, but I remember running into uh, Rob Liefeld and Marat Michaels, mm -hmm. and I had already known them. Uh, I'd been friends with those guys for a couple years at that point. And uh, I asked Rob, hey, what's going on? Because I knew he had, you know, X-Force was coming, and uh, all this stuff. And, and, uh, he, he said that they were going to break away and create this company and it was going to be him, Eric and Todd, and they were going to call it McLarfeld. Uh, that was literally what they were going to call it. McLarfeld. There was no, 
No, it's like it a is. bad fast food chain. It does. McLar yeah. Let's go down to McLarfeld. <laughs> hey, get me number three from McLarfeld's, huh? Yes. Ah, so good. good. Fresh cherry limeade with every order. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I know. I know that um, a lot of it was was Rob and I think Todd. Like you can have an idea of of of, uh, of building a fire, but you need firewood, right? Yeah. And I I feel like uh, Eric and Rob were definitely sparks, but I feel like Todd took on the mantle of fueling the thing. Um, but again, this is like completely a subjective opinion. I, you know, I'm, I'm met those guys. Like I said, I met Rob, I met Todd before I met, uh, what up death metal. Uh, death metal what up, hero? I, met, I met Todd a couple months before I met Rob, but, uh, <laughs> Rob, I, I had a much more, um, contact and interaction with Rob in those days. But, um, I think Todd is, 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 um, more of sort of a mastermind. I mm -hmm. think putting the thing together, having a mission statement, having sort of a, a story and a theme behind what image is and, mm -hmm. and was, I think that's Todd. I think the idea of, you know, going and do comics on your own is, is a, it was Rob and Eric, but I, I believe like the whole independence and, and, you know, fight the man and all that stuff came from mm -hmm. Todd. Yeah. Now, you know, it's kind of cool in, in, I think it's neat, like, you know, Bo was talking about how he would go and he'd see Todd, you know, he'd be talking to, you know, aspiring uh, creators, you know, comic book creators and kind of uh, encouraging them, teaching them, you know, not about just drawing and writing, but the business and building their brand. And, you know, you do mention Rob and, you know, you hear a lot of horror stories about the guy and you hear a lot of good things about the guy. But there is one thing I did not notice, like. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Again, this is just because, you know, as a fan and stuff, you get to read stories, hear things, this and that. But it seems like he, like, really gave a lot of people opportunities. Like, oh, hey, you know, that's pretty cool. Come work for me. Or, oh, or yeah. it's like, it seemed like he really, like, tried to bring in a lot of young creators. Yeah, Rob Rob was really good good at that. I mean, um, maybe I'm biased, but I, I, I always felt like his studio – um, when all is said and done, we went and did the most, you know, and I'm not knocking anything from those other guys. Cause the, you know, the, all the other studio had incredible artists and, and guys that can draw circles around me. But as far as like overall potential, you had Andy Park, who's over at Marvel doing all the concept stuff and all the, you know, costumes and concept for all the Marvel cinematics you had. Uh, Jeff Matsuda, Emmy Award winning, um, you know, Batman guy, Chap Yape, uh, overdoing animation. Um, you've got Stephen Platt, who went on to, he, you know, storyboards directing. You had me, who, you know, went off to direct for HBO and, and uh, you know, worked for Mattel for six and a half years, shepherding their content. Um, I think Rob, that, that one of his greatest abilities is that sort of um, eye for potential. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. If this were baseball, Rob would have been the perfect scout because yeah. he has an eye for talent, always yeah. has. And yeah. is Dan did just att attested young talent. He could, yeah. you know, you could always recognize older talent in the industry, you know, people that have already there and made it. But Rob had, I've always felt a sixth sense about seeing somebody's artwork or whatever they're doing and saying, yes, yes, you're, I can see he could see somebody in year one, but he, what he was seeing was year five for yeah. him already. Uh, always had, always had an eye for that stuff. Yeah, definitely. Now being part of like, you know, working with these guys, you know, for you, Fraga being over extreme, Bo working with Todd. I mean, do, do you think we can ever have that type of boom again? Who's to say nothing lasts forever. I mean, uh, it, people my age, who would have ever thought Sears and Roebuck would be out of business? Hey, they had right. a run for a hundred years. They're gone. Yeah. You never know. You can Montgomery just, Ward's gone. Woolworth's yeah. gone. Yeah. Uh, you just, you never know. Yeah. Anything can happen. And another image could ever, you know, could happen. It, it, I don't say, think it would be image per se, but it would be something new. Um, mm -hmm. Something that um, no one's tried before. And that part of, a lot of people would be going, hey, why didn't why the hell didn't we think about that before? That's the way stuff goes. I mean, you know, look at us right now. We're on these different screens. We're talking to me. 
uh, 20 years ago, who would have thought that would be happening? You know, I it think about that often. Chaplain, you know, yeah, yeah. It's I think about that often. I I just uh, last week bought my very first VR headset. I, I'd never done virtual reality before, and I'm learning about it. And I'm I found out that you can sculpt something. Like a, this yeah, is what's crazy, too. yeah. Right? You consider this, right? You can sculpt something in a place that doesn't exist and send it <laughs> out of that place that doesn't exist to a printer. And that thing that was in your head that you made in a place that doesn't exist is in your hands. Yep. <laughs> that is crazy. And That's see scary. what you're talking about right now, Dan, this, this makes me smile because I first met Dan. We were talking about this a few minutes ago at Rob's house. Uh, this was during one of the early, image owners meetings yeah. and i'd met um uh, dan for the first time at rob's house that's what you i, a couple that's when I guys used to live were, there that's when i used yeah, to live at rob's I think, house. yeah that's when it yeah. was and yeah. uh in fact i think rob had just bought the house not you know he hadn't been living there that long and stuff yeah but uh, and we all stayed the night it was nuts but that's when i very first met dan then i would see dan a lot when i would come in for a week at a time in anaheim and go over to extreme and hang out most of the time i hung out with dan and and talk to him and stuff because it was it was fun. But Dan was the young guy, and at that point in our relationship, you know, I was in my forties, so Dan yeah. was in his twenties. You know, he was young and stuff. But it's neat to hear you know you talk about picking up you know, the virtual. And now I'm thinking, wait a minute, no, Dan, you're the young guy. You're you're know, talking man. like me now. You're the young guy. Oh, you know? oh I'm on my way to fifty, buddy. So. Oh, it's hard to believe. Dan is, hard. Is, that, oh, Dan is way older than you were when you guys met. That's right. <laughs> like, That's when I got the magic screen here. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It, uh, that, but, that part's but, hard to believe. It's still to, hard for me to get used to seeing Danny Mickey with short hair. So, oh, right. You know. And Norm with short hair and, uh, yeah. or, or, you know, with adult children. And, it, yeah, it's it's pretty nuts. But I'd say going going back to your question, Niall, uh, I don't think it could ever be replicated in in a one for one sort of way, but I definitely believe that there that everything is cyclical. You know, even even comics. Think about the the days of you know Eisner um, and Simon and Kirby and what was going on. They didn't they didn't have anybody to look back on. They were looking at illustrators to learn how to work, and then you know, they were doing it to make a living in hopes to get into advertising. You know, it was yeah. like, it was sort of a stepping stone. And then of course we had the whole seduction of the innocent stuff happen in the fifties where, uh, that's where stuff got really kind of campy and silly, uh, because they had a really, you know, suck, suck the life out of it. So comics were kind of weird numbers were dropping. And then along comes, um, Stan Lee and, and Kirby and they, they bring it back up with these relatable, heroes in the 60s and then you know you go through the 70s that sort of lull where you had all those monster books and the d weird talking duck and all that and then along comes the direct market uh and that brings things back up and then it's you always know, changing yeah yeah and and i think right now um industry wise like there's obviously some crazy trends going on there's a lot of um stuff happening in mainstream the the cur world's current state of affairs isn't helping anything um, I mean, it's very a lot of fragility uh, in the industry itself, but you also see guys um, and and the theme of your show, the crowdfunding comics. There's, I feel like that's a revolution in itself, where creators, you know, can can actually give it a go. You you know, like when I don't know if you you guys, I know you remember Bo Billy, you, uh, you probably remember too, but you, remember when um, when the Image guys did Phantom Force for Kirby. Yeah. Yep. You know, and they basically at the end of it gave him a check, you know, for for like, hey, thanks. Jack, here's your, you know, your cut, which was a major cut. This is the yeah. biggest amount of money Jack had ever seen in his entire life. Here here we are, the, the architect of, you know, hey, I'm Jack Kirby. I created Stan Lee. Yeah. I mean, the Marvel Universe. And um, you, this guy lived a humble, humble, simple life. Um, but he never got to see the dividends of his hard work. That's where I think the, the big shift is right now is with, with crowdfunding, 
you're talking directly to your fans. Yeah. Uh, you're, yeah. You, and, and, and along with platforms like YouTube, Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, you can communicate with your fans, invite them on your show. You know, talk about uh, having having a direct line to to your um, to, to who you. I mean, it's like a, a telepathic link. Back in the day, we yeah. used to kind of do shots in the dark. You know, like yep. uh, I, I'm going to do this. I hope they like it. You know, and and now it's like you find out instantly. It's that uh, evolution of the next step. Yeah. So I, I, de I definitely feel like right now we're in a very exciting time, whether it's image 2.0, I don't think it's that. I almost feel like it's a lot it's more like market 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. Or like I feel, especially with new creations or recent, you know, Captain America was uh, an old creation that was made anew uh, and, and brought things up and in, you know, and, and Fantastic Four was just challengers of the unknown uh you know f fixed up a bit uh i feel like we're almost in um 1961 all over again bro i feel the same way and it's and, and it is it's a amazing time i mean all of us the three of us we've done crowdfunded books um you know dan Bo, and and myself niall and, and uh brian will be doing it their own next year uh, oh, wow. what's so cool is that this is like 1962 but I think it's probably more like 1992. I think this explosion of 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 energy and of and different voices coming out and people want to publish their own comic and they're doing it. It's almost like the little rascals, like, hey, let's put on a show, let's clean out the barn and put on a show, and yeah. anyone can do it. And even if and anyone, if if you're if, if you're organized enough and if you're if you're passionate enough and if you actually follow through and you can create your own business. You could start with a comic book. You could put together a book and do it through crowdfunding, through Indiegogo, or through Kickstarter. But you could do a, a level that it's just a digital version. I mean, it's I mean, it's not a level. It's a digital campaign. Yeah. We yeah. want to pay. We're raising funds to actually have a digital comic book. Uh, and then and then you once you get that digital comic book done, then you could then then you could have your next campaign, which is for the printed version of it. And sure. you, within a matter of months, can become a bona fide <laughs> comic book publisher. You own your own properties instead of working for them because we saw what happened to the mainstream when the pandemic hit and within a few weeks of it hitting, you know, with the old pencils down movement, uh, pencils down order and all that crap. Look, you got boom, incredible comics, man. Incredible. Incredible. You got your you incredible got your comics, comics, comics right, right here. <laughs> Way better than amazing, right? Yeah. You got your you See, got your that Niles, Niles throws Niles into, is, into the ocean to this is called turtle, turtle killer turtle killer comment turtle killers. I just want to say, Billy, maybe you think it's still the '60s because you know you've been doing nothing but writing about Nazi, he has that cute Nazi killing, on. and you've been you've been you've been worrying about uh you've been worrying about all the Nazi killing with that book. What's it called? Oh, a lot of Nazis. Miss Fury. Killing a lot of Nazis. Yeah. Still, Great. still, still three days. Left uh, on and still available on Indiegogo. Yep, Heck we yeah. end up Monday. Um, uh, we went, we end up Monday. I'm going to be talking about it, but the scary thing is, I got to be honest with you. Every time I promote it, we lose, <laughs> we lose, <laughs> we lose back. Yeah. Really I'm pissed off at Dynamite. I'm going to drop that. <laughs> like, you know, let me be cool and let's just let it let it just end. <laughs> we'll go in demand. And, uh, but I got plans for for going forward with Miss Fury in 2021. Yeah, so, uh, we'll see what happens, but it's a great book uh, for anyone out there. Uh, Maria Laura Sanapo and I are just busting our butts, and Cindy Dela Cruz and Mindy Lopkin. I talked to Mindy yesterday for an hour, and she was just she is just so passionate about it. And so, they everyone just feels so strongly about this character, and also this woman, June Tarpe Mills, who Tarpe Mills was a victim of cancer, she was super successful, and they just like we got to shut this woman down. She's not conforming to what we're supposed to do. It's not, believe it or not, it's not the 40s anymore. The 40s were far more um, uh, far more uh, <laughs> aggressive and fearless because the war, you know, was on. That you could do things in 40s comics that you couldn't do in 1950s comics, in 1951. Yeah. And then the whole Wortham thing came. And it was a very scary time because of the whole thing with the Soviets and the bomb. And it was a, a very, very scary time. And, uh, and, uh, it killed her and it broke her heart. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and we're we're gonna make sure that 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 that, that doesn't happen anymore, and, and everyone knows who June Tarpe Mills is, and they never forget her. And the Legacy, baby. Never forget. Yep, we're we're a damn freight train. You know, we're a steam engine. And you know what it's like, Dan. Every you know, if you're on social media, you're gonna get it. People who you don't even know, who don't even have their own real names, and they're just saying stupid stuff, attacking people, and it's just a cesspool. Yeah, There's it's no uh, it's people. it gets tiring. Uh, my advice. And, and I need to take it, you know, it's like, uh, I, I, I likened the Twitter mob to the sirens of the sea, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the, you know, the story of the sirens that try to sing you in and, and yeah. sing you in, and then you go in and you're, you're shipwrecked, you're done. Uh, the, the key is to just keep sailing, you know, That's just it. keep on That's sailing. It. And it. I, I mean, I've, I've broke my own advice uh times but that's i need to just um just put that shit on a wall mm-hmm. sail on sailing sail on away, sailor sailing away going sail away that's... with me so you're Catch going turtles. you're going you're going with I cut sticks, these. And I mean, I'm I cut thinking that video loading up for cross where is that video it's it's processing now why didn't you Process. just send it to me um cuz for some reason it, it wouldn't let me save it and i'd have to load up the whole big giant one it seems so you're, uh, are you uploading it to YouTube? Yeah, I'm uploading to private YouTube, and then I'll I'll just share it. Where? Yeah. Okay, can you tell me the source okay, of it? Yeah, because I, give me one second. I'll get the videotape. Hang on. Oh, it's on. Well, where, but the where did source it of it? From? No, Willie, he doesn't mean what is it on. Yes, yeah. you know it's a video. I, I want to know the source. Well, it's this <laughs> tape. You it's see? like the source is this videotape. It's got a thing in here, and you put it in the magic player. Yeah. Dad, get me fruit snacks. Yeah. Grab my computer. It's on the computer. <laughs> How do you get the files out? <laughs> Wait, why am I in there? No, <gasps> I'm just wondering because that the um, I'm pretty aware of like all the old shit. You know, like he's got maybe, some cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. There, I've got a couple of videotapes of stuff that I haven't digitized yet, but I'm always surprised like when someone puts a photo up i'm like oh shoot i don't i, I remember th- i have a good memory and i'm like a lot like bo bo you'll like this i'm gonna show you something <laughs> well, he has footage of bo from the dc disco night you see this crazy. Oh, do you see this bo? yes sir this is my very first journal okay Excellent. my very first entry february 8th 1986 oh see this is great this is i've great. kept a journal i've kept a journal since i was 12 so, and I've got I've got about four of these. I've, I've even got a bigger one over there that's just yeah, your art journal is incredible. <laughs> the video that you made with all the pictures that you drew. Oh, thanks, man. Pretty impressive. This, that's the yeah. best. That's the this is good stuff. This is good. Yeah. But yeah. So that's, how many uh, journals do you have, Dan? Uh, I got a bunch. I mean, like here's here's the one I'm I'm working on right now. Uh, it's almost done. It's uh. Do you just write about like your day? If you I don't write about asking? my day. I write about my thoughts. I write about if something happened. But uh, yeah, the the first entry in this one is December two thousand two, mm-hmm. and then the last entry in this one is June third of this year. So I I don't write Sweet. every day, mm-hmm. uh, but I write a lot. That's and you perfect. can tell this one. That's I mean, great. this one's this one's eighteen years old, and it's all taped. That's up the best. Yeah. That yeah. that is the best. Because yeah. up, upstairs, I've probably, I mean, we're talking well over 100, Phil. Oh, wow. Do you ever I just mean, go right? back and read your journals? Oh, yeah, constantly. Plus, I mean, constantly. And I've got, when I'm working on a book, mm-hmm. everything goes in into one of these right off the bat. I mean, layouts, everything. And I can't draw stick figures, mm-hmm. but everything's out there of every book. Mm-hmm possibly that I've probably ever done. I've done, you know, hundreds and hundreds. Now it's, I think you either do that like Dan and I, or you don't, you know, some people don't have to, but it it works for me. It works for Dan, obviously. I've been doing it since I was a kid. I'm the worst at what you're talking about though, Bo. Um, Like this, I write thoughts and happenings, Mm -hmm. but my process, I have all over, like literally all over in stacks. I grab uh, I literally grab whatever piece of paper is around mm-hmm. and I, I scrawl it down and I keep it in a stack of to be reviewed. <laughs> and then I, once I review it, I have a program called OneNote. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and I, I use OneNote to, to organize it all and kind of, that's, that's you know, 
It is. That's yeah. that's the best. I love I love hearing that people still write down, take pen to paper, whether they're yeah. drawing, they're writing, they're writing down their thoughts, whatever. That's something I've done all my life. And it just it's one of those things where it makes me feel like, okay, I'm not the only one out there that thinks this way. You yeah. know, it's kind of like a serial killer that reads a headline where Oh, he killed five puppies. Oh, I'm not that weird, you know. Right. So, <laughs> well, that's a great the, comparison. That's, great comparison. Yeah, that's the wonderful that's like thing a serial about, killer. about um, <laughs> for puppies. Work, yeah, for puppies. Working in the the creative field is, um, you hear a lot of stories, especially like people that worked in comics. You know, mm -hmm. like um, most most comic book artists that I've ever met are introverts. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they live inside their head. A lot of the time, um, a lot of them, you know, are have opinions, but they've been mulling those opinions over, you know, 10 hours of yeah. sitting there drawing. And, you know, so they're, mm -hmm. they're very opinionated. It's not just an opinion. It's one that they've spent a lot of time thinking about. And, mm -hmm. um, but that, that's why there's this sort of kinship in this community, um, you know, when it's at its best right now, I, yeah. you know, I don't think the comic community is at his best. Neither would little Thanos right there. He should, he needs to snap this place. <laughs> he needs to snap this place out uh, a little bit. You know, you uh, bring up the journaling, but like there was actually a Kickstarter at one point that, you know, they combined and I picked it up cause I just thought it was cool. Right. Something to yeah. doodle in and it's the, I draw comic sketchbook reference guide, but it's in journal format. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And, oh. and they, you know, they made it. And honestly, like if you were just creating, like you can practice, you know, perspective in here. I mean, oh. I never drew in it because I mean, I have other stuff for that. I just got it because I thought it was a really cool concept. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have like your stuff and then you, it's like your own journal yeah. uh, of the creative process. Make I think it is more of a, a learning thing, right? Yeah. But, no. Yeah. I guess I could do that. Make yourself big. Don't tell him that, Brian. <laughs> he'll, he'll start putting his pop, hands below pop, the camera. Pop that yes. collar, bro. Pop that collar. I'll make collar. myself big. I'll make you into a banana split, you, you I'm yellow gonna go shirt. Enhance, enhance. Yeah, so, and I don't even know if you can still find these. It was I Draw Comics, Sketchbook, and Reference Guide. And it's like a journal format. Thank you, Billy. A journal format. And, and it went through everything. And, you know, it's cool because, you know, my first comic book is, you know, I'm, wor you know, working on, I'm going to have a crowdfunded. The goal was the end of this year, but doing the show and having the twin boys, which turned two this Saturday. Oh, type. man. Happy birthday, uh, you boys. The, uh, oh, you know, great. slowed down the process. But the jur it was funny. I was writing, right? And I'm putting my ideas. I have done. I'm like, I, I need a vessel to write in. And I just happened to go by, I went into, actually went into Staples, right? And I'm going into Staples and I was getting some ink cartridges and I saw this blue journal and I'm like, that's it. That is what I need. <laughs> I, and I got you. that journal and I wrote, everything is laid out there. All my characters, all their breakdowns, it's tabbed out because it's really not in order. Cause once I get a thought, I just start writing it. And then I'm like, Man. okay, this goes with page seven even though I'm on page, you know, 109, because yeah. it's just like 300 pages in this thing. And, uh, but it's cool because sometimes I think the vessel, you know, like how music can kind of guide your mood and creativity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes the vessel makes you feel more creative. That's true. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, clothes, um, make the, clothes make the man now. I, I don't like clothes. Yeah, we know. We can tell. Yeah, it's we interesting know. You, you bring that up. up a couple of times. You're like me. Survive. It's interesting you bring that up because um, I've always – I grew up near the Bay Area, so I've always been sort of like – my favorite season is the fall. I like hoodies. I like, you know, jeans, socks, shoes, that sort of thing. Art. What's up, Art to Bear? They um, are Captain but, Buddy Bear. Yeah, but, there's uh, a character. Last, last Tuesday, I, I had this surgery, and I haven't been wearing any shoes. Like mm -hmm. bending over and putting my shoes on has been a bitch, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, – I got it been eight days. Today was the first day. I my wife's birthday's tomorrow, so I had to go out and get her. Get her, still birthday, her you know. birthday week. I will. Happy birthday. Yeah. She's turning more years old. It's awesome. <laughs> and uh so <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh I put shoes on today and I hadn't worn shoes in eight days and it felt very uncomfortable. And now I understand when people say they want to be barefoot all the time. I totally <laughs> get it. So mm -hmm. Niles. 
uh, or Nile. I, I get, I get that you uh, don't like clothes because it's, uh, it's be freedom. fun to walk around. But just uh, put it this way: there's always a breeze here, and it just feels nice. <laughs> feels right. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. We found out. We found out that Nile is always naked under his clothes. It's weird. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> always. It's always hey, somebody's gotta, birthday under there. Yeah. yeah. So Keaton Smith uh, asks, any advice on writing comics? I have cool ideas all the time, but struggle turning them into stories. Have a theme. That's I think like for me, my starting point is always having a theme. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always good to have a concept. Like with Black Flag. I go, you know, uh, it's hell on earth, right? And they're they're fighting against uh, the 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 hell coming to earth. But my theme is uh, earth belo- has always belonged to hell, mm-hmm. and we 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 are living in in the devil's space, and we always have been, and that that we are, you know, uh, dealing with the rules of the devil. And when I when I start thinking about the theme of the thing, everything starts to fall into place. I thought the theme was friendship. I guess I blew that one way off. Well, friendship is magic. Oh, I like that one. Friendship is magic. So wait, is friendship even real then? Friendship's real. Friendship's real, bro. Yeah. Bo, what? Any advice uh, for Keaton? Um, I'm a pretty bad person to ask for advice in that aspect because the way my mind works and the way I worked, and this Mm -hmm. has—it's been since I was a kid. The stuff, and I think I used to draw. I drew until the ninth grade, and then at the ninth grade, I just I just knew it's you're no better than you were in the sixth grade. So stop. Mm. Just mm. focus on the story, and I did. And but in my head, I always see it uh, in a cinematic, whether it's television or movie style. I see everything there. I've always written full scripts, and even when I was a kid. It may yeah. not have looked technically like that, but I'm not a very good person at that because I cannot tell you to here, here's what do what I do. But right. I see it in my head. I can put that into paper, my panel descriptions, the whole thing, and it just the dialogue comes. Dialogue's very important to me. But um, and I gotta be very honest, I've been doing this for 34 years writing, and a lot of it I make up as I go. I mean, I don't have an outline of here's the beginning, the middle, the end. I've got to break this down to this, this, this. A lot of times I break it down uh, as I go. And Mm, for me, this being spontaneous like that works because Mm -hmm. in cases where I've worked at DC and and other companies on stuff that I do not own, um, if there's a lot of rewrites, things like that, I lose interest. And as I lose interest, the story loses interest to mm-hmm. me and it's not turning in my best stuff per se, but I, yeah, um, yeah. I think I work a little bit with a hybrid of what you're talking about. And, and when I talk, I have a co-writer and what I, t- what I tell him is I, I call it pearls and strings, right? Like mm-hmm. if you take, for example, something like the dark Knight, you know, and you think about like key moments, mm-hmm. things that happen, I call those pearls, right? Like, this must happen, this must happen, this must happen. And I know my ending and there's these definite things, but everything that happens in between those, that's jazz. As mm-hmm. long as I get to that piece yes, that moves it to the next piece, all the in between, I can be have as much fun and craziness as I want. And the string is, is the theme. Like I think of things all visually anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the the string is my guiding compass. Those pearls are sort of impactful incidents. Yeah, but then I'm allowing myself the jazz of doing whatever I want in between those parts. Mm-hmm. That's the same with me. I always know the the ending. I always yeah. know the ending right off the bat. So everything is is working at that. I was on a panel one time, me and four other writers. Mark Wade was one of them. And each the uh, moderator each went down to the line. How do you do this? How do you? And they had an example of each one of us comic book, our comics that we did. And it got to my part, and I I said, well, I knew I was doing this, but this 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 I just made up as a went. Did your editor know? No, he didn't know what I was. You know, I handed it in, <laughs> and Mark was horrified, horrified. Now you got to think, Mark's you know a writer 
an editor. He's he's done all that stuff, and he was horrified. He goes, "How can you do that? How can you not know what street you're going to walk down?" I said, "That's the part for me. That's that's fun and exciting. It keeps it interesting for me. I get to discover that almost like the reader does, mm -hmm. and it works for me. It may not work for Mark, but everybody's yeah. got their their own way of doing it. I mean, I worked with Billy on Wolverine. She, mm -hmm. Billy and I have a totally different way of <laughs> of writing stories it worked in that <laughs> case but it, i've only written co-written with chuck dixon on a couple of books and then uh melanie scrofano who plays winona earp on the show and tim rosan who plays doc holiday i wrote co-wrote some stuff with them and i i cannot co-write with just any because a lot of times they are too regimented they're too we got to get to this and get to that. And it's like Dan was talking about. I'm more of the jazz part of, okay, let's flow. Let's, 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 let's move with this. Let's move with that. And it works. It works for me or someone would have tossed me out of the party 34 years ago. But um, I, I, getting back to what Keaton was asking, write, just write, write yeah. down. You'll change it. You'll fool with it. And with computers, it's a lot easier than it was when I started out on a typewriter with carbon is you can change it as it goes along. Nothing just because you write it down on paper doesn't mean it's set in stone. You can mm -hmm. change that. And with technology mm -hmm. now, you know, you can change everything, the art, the colors uh, and the story. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. you know what I find uh, with my writing, uh, cause I'm an artist first and, and then I'm obviously writing my own is that a lot of my story comes when I'm drawing, when I'm designing my characters. Like as the story's in my head, I start getting it out on paper. Then as I start designing, you know, all right, I'm gonna work on a, on this henchman or this character or the main villain. All of a sudden, yeah. like, well, A, I'm drawing and making crazy sound effects and shit, because that's just what I do. And then, you know, but I'm also like writing that story. Like I'm writing that battle scene now that I'm designing this character. And then I'll stop and I start writing out, you know, just a quick breakdown of everything that I'm doing or, I talk and I record it and then I play it back later so I can jot down those ideas yeah. because I get almost like movies are playing in my head when I'm drawing or yes. I'm putting together a panel and it's actually, I'm, I'm playing the whole story in my head as a visual and yeah. I have to take that visual and I have to convert it to text, which has been, you know, a challenge I found because the mind always wants to change things. It's a mental uh, and Billy will tell you, I, I, one thing Billy tells you all the time, man, if you're, if you're that crazy about that font, bro, your, your, your <laughs> comics never coming out. Cause I'm like, no, let's do yeah. this. No, let's do that. Let's change this. You know, image I don't like that angle. You, you know? want to use image streaming. Now there's, if you yeah. go to winwanger.com, it's W I N W E N G E R.com. Winwanger. Um, he talks about this process called image streaming where mm -hmm. you record, you close your eyes and you basically record um, what you're seeing. Like, you know, uh, if you're, you know, going through an action sequence or whatever, you can mm -hmm. play the movie in your head, but describe it like you would in present tense to a blind person. Yeah, that's you what know? I do. That's basically what I do while yeah. I'm drawing. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's yeah. pretty cool. Well, yeah, we'll have to check that out. For sure. Yeah, and, and you could also be like if you're an artist as well. I mean, look at what um, when um, Eric Larson was on the show. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just start drawing. Yeah. And I, I come up the story as I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's no real rules. Have fun. No, I, they're, they're right. Sit right. There are new rules. Have fun. But have and have your ending though. Yeah. Yeah. God sakes, have your ending. My biggest part starting out was the technical part of what the script looked like what a plot looked like it was so great before i got into the business long before there were a couple of guys walt simonson was one and mike Barron was another that i just wrote and said i, I want to you know i'm writing i want to be a writer what's a plot look like both of them sent me their versions what they hand in this is what marvel likes this is what dc they didn't have to do that they oh, didn't know me from adam they just sent it to me so that helped out a lot when I was doing scripts. Robert Kaniger, who Sergeant Rock, you know, and so many of the other DC things that he uh, created and wrote and did, did not know me from Adam. Um, ended up being, until he passed away, a friend of mine. And he said, Bo, here, sent me piles of scripts. This is the, just make it look like this. Do your own story, but make it look like this. He in turn... 
but uh, again, this is before I got into business, turned me to Murray Boltonoff, who was a longtime editor at DC Comics. And every Wednesday, Murray and I would have the, well, we'd have these conversations with, through correspondence. Then he said, Bo, every Wednesday, give me a call at this time. He goes, and we'll talk. I said, Gee, wow. you know, okay. So I would call the DC office and Murray would go over stuff with me. Well, then it got to the part where Joe Kubert came in on Wednesdays and met with Murray, you know, on their books. So I would talk. That's where I, Joe and I first met Billy. We talked about this when we did the panel with Joe. Joe ended up being my friend long before Andy and Adam ever were. And mm -hmm. on Wednesdays, I would talk to Joe. I would talk to Murray. And then throughout the week, Robert would call or I would call him. He called me from England in the middle of the night one time to tell me about his idea for an Avengers graphic novel. It was going to be 100 pages long. Of course, Joe is going to draw it. And the thing about it is, Bo, none of the Avengers will wear clothes. They will have a brand on their chest of their insignia, and that's the only way. But other than that, they'll all be nude. Wow. And <laughs> I was sitting there waiting. Okay, punchline. He's going to tell me he's kidding. Okay, he's drunk or this. But there was no, he was dead serious. And then he went to explain this, this whole 100-page thing, and it made sense. It was the... It was ahead of its time. It was weird and wacky. But I had so many people in that day and age before technology that were kind and didn't have to be to help me become a writer uh, with just the technical parts of it. They never said, do it this way, do it that. This is what you got to do to keep an editor from throwing it in the trash. And that was huge information for me. Yeah, one, of the, one of the things that I noticed as uh, a penciler in comics is that there almost was no format you know i would get i would get um your marble style plot from someone like frank thierry yeah which which was you know maybe a few pages worth of of uh this happens this happens they go there he's upset she does this he does this but not a lot of not a lot of uh it's definitely not a full script yeah and and, and i've also worked from very prescriptive the the panel one you know, the camera's up high, panel two, it's a bigger shot. We're now on so-and-so, like it's very, like telling me what to do. Um, and, and then there's the extreme, you know, the Alan Moore script, mm -hmm. which is, you know, two pages to describe panel one, yeah. telling you where the pen on the desk is, you know, and what angle that it's at. And, you know, uh, so I, I think for format, I don't think people should get too caught up in format. No. I think they should write in the way that they feel comfortable. Obviously, you don't. It should want just to... look like a script, just visually, you yeah. know, so that the editor doesn't toss yeah. it away or panic. No, mm -hmm. Dan, you and I worked together on the Berserkers, and yeah. that was full script. Yeah. But and and I don't know if, if you're if you remember or not, but I that was the first time we'd worked together and stuff. And my I point was rails a bunch. <laughs> no, I said that this is full script. And I said, this is not here to say, Dan, draw this, 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 but to give you the mood. And then you, in a collaboration, are going to add your creative layers on top of it, which you did in spades. And this is no bullshit because you're sitting here. I would get the pencils in. You know, you'd send Xeroxes in or I'd get the pencils in and stuff through fax. And it was just like, yes, this is what I had in my head only better because you added a perspective to it. You added an action point in there that I didn't have. And yeah. that to me is always the best thing with working on, with an artist is that collaboration of collaboration, getting what you've got here. If it's something you're writing and then bang, it comes out, it's mm -hmm. a cake, but all of a sudden it's got icing and candles on it, you know? Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just, I look forward to that. Now granted, there's been times when I've had it in, full scripts and stuff and it's uh, and it's come back a nightmare but mm. those are few and far between probably the weirdest one I've, I've worked with a lot of artists that are foreign you know and don't speak english so i've either worked through their interpreter or just do broken english and i learned my lesson i had a full script and in one panel description i said okay in this scene so and so is beating the shit out of so and so well i get the pencils in the guy's getting beat up and there's shit coming out his butt you know, oh, no. and, yeah, he literally, and I yeah. forgot, 
you know, I've got to start watching what I say because in my panel description sometimes. He, he's I, knocking I, his head off. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's rolling. It's rolling down the aisle. So That's and, hilarious. Yeah, Chuck Dixon uh, warned me of that. He'd worked with a lot of uh, artists uh, from other countries before, and this mm -hmm. is in the early days before we had so much communication. He goes, he goes, just be be pinpoint because if not, you're going to get what you asked for. And I said, okay, all right, you got that's it. That's great, man. I never heard that story, Bo. That's funny. Yeah. One of our guests yeah. that happened to him. I was like, man, I love this. You know, this panel where the guy's face is getting punched right off. He's like, yeah, he's like, you know, my artist. It, it looks. He's like, it's cool. We kept it, but you know, I was telling the guy, you know, like he hits him so hard, it's like his face flies off. You know, and <laughs> and, and and so the guy drew him getting punched and his face being torn off. <laughs> uh, but it worked for the book. <laughs> oh, I think that happened a few spawns, hasn't it? <laughs> go in there and put his lights out, and he's out there just hitting switches. <laughs> <laughs> the neat thing about, like, when Dan and I worked together, and when I was at Image, and you know, being uh, I was VP of marketing for Image as a whole, each one had their own studios, but I was overseeing a lot of that. Was when I would go out there for a week or, or two weeks. I would spend time at each studio and, you know, whether it was me and Tony Levito or me and Larry Martyr, we would travel to each one and go over stuff with them. And it was so different, but it was so neat at the same time because each, as Dan can attest, each studio had their own personality and their own oh, yeah. uh, work way. And now, you describe Bo. Can you give us a difference of some of them? Say, like, what was Extreme Studios like compared to to Todd, and how was it, that? Ex to well, Todd, Todd, we were like I said, there were only five of us at one time, so it was a very tight um, family. It, it it really was. Everyone uh, knew what we were doing, and we we did it. And Todd, like Dan said before, when he hired somebody to do something, I'm hiring you, Bud, because you know how to do this job. I'm not going to be here to tell you how to do it. To watch over your shoulder, but you do it. And <laughs> good impression. You That's you really do good. it. So that was good. Extreme. I'll I'll start with extreme was to me. This is in my perspective, and just you know, I was a little no, bit older than I everybody love, else. I love hearing this stuff because um, I have that saying: it's hard to read the label when you're in the jar. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we were. I was so embedded. So I I got to hear this. I need to hear this. Well, Extreme was a lot of Rob's own charisma and and persona. Everyone was seemed younger at Extreme. And I think they were if if you looked at statistics, but it was it was chaos, but yet it was organized. Everything, you know, came and, and it was ideas flying constantly. It was like what was inside of Rob's head and it was exploding and splattering on everybody and everyone was able to do it. Um, I know a lot of people, uh, traditionalists or purists would go, you can't, dis you can't compare Rob Liefeld with Jack Kirby, but I do on the point that I think Rob's strongest point is ideas. He is an idea machine. Jack Kirby was an idea machine. I don't think either one of those two guys ever runs out of ideas. And that's what extreme was. Extreme to me was young guys, thousands of ideas. And then somehow every month that getting gathered together and ended up as comic books or different comic books. Sometimes it didn't, but that was image as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I came from a very traditional standpoint of, we don't do this, but I was always open to this can work. If extreme comics can make good comics and make things happen, make things different. It wasn't the traditional sense. Um, Mark Silvestri and I had known each other many, many years, long before Image and long, back when Mark was doing, he was at Chicago Con, him and his brother. His brother was actually a comic book writer, wannabe, know about, and Mark mm -hmm. worked in the gym and just happened to, well, I can draw really good. So he was doing sketches at a cardboard table for five bucks. And I've still got the I've still got the DC Wildcat drawing I had him do that I paid five bucks for. And then you know as we got to know each other, you know he got he got doing Conan and things like that, and got a name Mark. And Top Cow was was Mark's personality as well, and it was laid back. Mark is a very laid back, non confrontational kind of guy. You know he's he's a lot like Eric in the fact that I just want to do my stuff. 
and Mark hired people that um, to do those jobs for him. Um, yeah. He had Brad Foxhoven. He had uh, other people later on, Matt Hawkins, and, and people like a little like yeah, Dave. David was. David took to it real well. I thought he yeah. was. He had. He came in with some experience too, which was. But he had. You know, they were down Santa Monica. You know, everything was. It was. It was a nice place to go. You go to Jim Valentino's. Okay, then you're stepping one foot in traditional comics and another one in total independent. I mean, independent underground thinking. And Jim was always ahead of the curve. As far as a lot of creativity, even more so than any other image office, it was just sometimes I felt, because Jim's, I think, even a couple of years older than I am, there was a little ageism. There was like, okay, yeah, Jim, that's the way you all used to do it. That would be at owners' meetings and stuff. Sometimes that's what would be said. But what they were missing was Jim was right. You can do all the new stuff, but you just got to take it, you know, with a traditional mm -hmm. sense. It's got to be a melding of both. And it was always laid back there, and it was it was Randy, and it was uh, Jim, and uh, we we got points across and stuff. It was it was good. It was very very laid back and very small at that point. Uh, Eric was all done by phone because Eric, you know, you know, didn't have the same setup. Eric was like, Le leave me in the corner, Le left hand, leave me in the corner, let me draw. At the owners' meetings, everyone would be going crazy, doing different things. Eric could be in the corner drawing the entire time. Rob would be all him and Todd had a charisma thing going back and forth. So they had their mm -hmm. competitive things at meetings where they would, yeah, oh, it's this way. It's that way. No, let's do this. Let's do it. Then Jim Lee would come up and Jim had a vision of not only the creativity, but he was thinking about how can I take care of the artist, the letterer, the colorist, the, the guys back here that are doing this. How's the printer? He was looking at a bigger, vision mm -hmm. both creatively and business wise which i always admired i never saw jim upset mad uh he was very very composed he wasn't loud todd would get loud but he was never confrontational in a bad sense rob was mm -hmm. all rob could get fired up rob could get fired up that's just you know the way wills wills was there at the beginning wills again was very quiet sometimes i just got the feeling that wills just just let me do what I, I do here. Let me do comics. Wills was, <laughs> and Phil, Wills was very family oriented, and that always came first to him, his own family and, and what was going on and stuff. But it was uh, – and at those first few meetings, those very early ones, they used to talk about who they might – what creator they might pull in next to be a possible junior partner or someone mm -hmm. in training, and that that was – those were very interesting meetings because some of the names that came up and how those would be handled and, and such. And, and most everybody was pretty frank about it. And it was some were dead on and others were wrong. And I dreaded the point where every once in a while they go, well, Bo, what do you think about this guy? You know him. What do you think about this guy? And I was never, to be honest with you, I was never afraid of losing my job because there was always another one coming up after that. Mm -hmm. And, this would be a fun experience and stuff. And I was there a long time, but I always told the truth. And nine times out of 10, if they, they asked, then they knew what I was going to say and they would agree they were asking to agree with. It. But, um, I never had any problems with any of the owners, never any, um, I really don't have any bad stories. I mean, occasionally, um, different owners would yell, um, in moments of passion, at some of the people in their studio or something like that. That part I never agreed with because I, there's a difference between motivation and bullying. And this is before bullying was just something that happened in high school. You either took mm -hmm. care of it or you didn't, and you were traumatized by it or you got over it. You know, it, it worked out. But um, there were times like that. And business-wise, it was more mm – -hmm. um, I had – I had times when, and I don't, I'm, I'm going to cut this off here. Bro. I'm going too far. Um, where Todd would be mad at, at someone, whether it was in distribution or, or retail, they had done something or said something. It was against business. It was against uh, not 
you've hurt my feelings and I'm mad, but it was against a business move. You called that son of a bitch up and you <laughs> tell him, bah, bah, bah. and I mean, that it would, good. Todd, Todd has, Todd can swear with flair. And oh, yeah. I said, swear okay, I'll do it. He goes, he goes, I know you're an affable guy, Bo, but you tell him this. You tell him it came straight from me. So I would call that person. And sometimes this person would be um, a power person within the industry. Mm -hmm. And my relationship never was that with this person or that person that he would have. And I would call and I'd, I'd take Todd knees and translate it, get his point across, get what he wanted hopefully nine times out of 10 and then go back to Todd and say, did you talk to so-and-so? Yes, I did. Do you tell him, did you tell him exactly what I said? And I would lie through my teeth and go, yes, I did. Okay, then. All right. Then we got this, you know, and cause we get the deal that you mm -hmm. wanted. And I go, yes, we did. And then we go, and then bang, you know, uh, a year later, I'd have to do that again. But, um, <laughs> yeah. it was, but that's part of what he hired me for too. Mm -hmm. So it was, but I, I got to say, I learned, even though Todd's younger than me, and this is just talking old school, I learned a lot from him. Not so much within the business part or even the creative part and stuff, but his philosophy, his drive, and again, his what I call good competitiveness. Yeah. He is competitive the way it should be, not cut somebody's throat, but win by doing a better job yeah, and yeah. not gloating or bragging about it, anything like that. And there's the other thing with Todd. He's got a great sense of, he could fire you in the morning, but if he invited you to cook out at five o'clock that evening, you were at his house, the light switch came and you were a friend, you were friend, just like you've always been. You just, you know, y'all didn't discuss work or what happened that day. And he truly, it wasn't an act. It wasn't a, okay, now I've got to turn on nice Todd. That's just, he, it was respect is what it was. Mm -hmm. I invited this person. You know, I do like this person. They're not doing the job at work, so I had to get rid of them. But I still want them in my life in some aspects and stuff. And they remained that way. Yeah. I admired that because I'm, I couldn't do that. I, I was, no, that I couldn't have done that, but he did. And so he has a real understanding of, of people. I think that's why when he um, hired certain artists and writers to do work on his baby, his book, it was always trust. Um, if, if they ever stepped out of line, yeah, he would tell them, no, we're going to change this. But it was never, you can't do this. It was, I'm hiring you to do what you do best. And then he would let them do it. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he's a, he's a smart guy. And I don't mean a, uh, you know, the intellectual here, let me tell you how smart I am. He was just, you know, it just comes just from got he's, it. A, he's a, he's a good guy. That's yeah. just the only way I can put it. Entertaining guy. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got here, you've got, and everyone, Dan can tell you, everybody does their Todd imitation, which is to me has always been a cross between Bill Murray and Caddyshack and Homer Simpson. Yes. And those, <laughs> and, and right. you've never, you, you get imitated that much at a convention right? And Todd just smiles. He is, he rolls with the flow. And I, I spent a lot of time with his dad, Bob and his, bo his dad, Bob's been down here at the house a few times in his travels. Mm -hmm. And I think Todd gets so much of that from his dad, that personable, just, you love it. You know, you mm -hmm. love this guy to death, but Todd, you know, Todd is a fighter. Todd is, you know, you back him in a corner. You're going to have to, I always told him, you know, Todd's, about my size, you know, 5'10", 160, you know, at the most and stuff. And I used to have a fistacular past back in the day. And mm -hmm. I told him, I said, you're one of those guys that I never wanted to fight because you literally have to maim them so they can't get back up or kill them because he will keep getting up. Those are the kind of guys mm -hmm. you don't want. Billy knows this with his temper that he has, you, you, you don't want that guy that keeps coming back. You don't, they, you know, I'd much rather have somebody that's six, four, two twenty. If I win, what a victory. But if I lose, well, everybody expected that, but you, you fight some guy like him and it's just, and that's the way he is mentally. I mean, he's just, 
Again, I didn't mean to, but we are talking Todd, but yeah. um, I admire the guy a lot. Not hero worship, just ad admiration. Yeah. Now, Todd James, this is this is for both of you. He says, uh, did Todd give you guys any assistance in taking your properties to the next level on any platform or any other media? New Dan? Media? No, the, 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 the main place Todd has uh, helped me is uh, mindset and ideologies, his philosophies um you know the sort of what would todd do or you know that that sort of thing uh but never any like hey bud let me uh i'm can't i'm not gonna do the thing but uh, <laughs> you, you started with hey bud you started with hey bud hey, bud, hey let bud. me uh let me tell you about this thing pal uh he yeah there was never any like uh you know full-on like here's my agent or here's a number of uh so and so or here's an email of none of that ever happened it was just mm -hmm. sort of you know, if you want something, go for it, give it your all, that, that sort of thing. Exactly. That's, um, the same thing that he, he knew, he knows that I'm a West, an old West historian and have been all my life. And he always has known of my, uh, interest in Wyatt Earp and, and all that. In fact, when I was down there, I got to go to Tombstone when I was there and they said, you but he, he brought up, um, for instance, and he did his homework. He read a couple of the wider books that books I gave him. And he goes, but he goes, your problem, you know, with this, we're, this is in context to something that was going on business wise and stuff that we had going on. He goes, but he goes, you know what the problem is? He goes, but this is part of the reason why I hired you, but you're too affable. He goes, and mm. just like Jim Masterson got himself killed because he was trying to talk a guy out of handing over his gun and the guy ended up shooting me. He goes, that, keep in mind, that can always happen to you. He goes, don't change, but keep that in mind that the person you're talking to is not always going to be as affable. And mm -hmm. to be real honest with you, that's always stuck with me and has helped me Great. out in a lot of situations where nice guy Bo would have let something pass and, you know, I ended up not doing it and uh, it worked for me. So that's about as close as I can get. Other than that, it was just like Dan. You want it, go for it. If you want it bad enough, you will figure out your way to do it. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. now, first of all, I want to say, if, if we go back, I don't have a temper. I no. don't know, Billy. The stories what? I hear. No. I don't know. Temper, man. Your old name used to be Napoleon Time Bomb. Syndrome. Uh, old you, will not time back bomb. you will not back down if, if cornered, Billy. No, no. That's well, I had, that, I had a, an interesting experience with Todd and Rob when somehow when there was some uh, – Tension between Rob and Mark when Mark left Image briefly for a while and, and had just, it was just Top Cow. Somehow got back to them and everybody else said, This is my fault. <laughs> I'm a little told to do it. Um, after hearing the story, I might have, he called me, we were talking, I might have said, That's pretty messed up. That's what I would do. But I, we're at San Diego Comic Con, maybe 96, 97. And I'm walking in the lobby of the Marriott, and I see him and Rob come walking right towards me. <laughs> Hot piss, right? And I'm like, oh, man. He's like, uh, can I talk to you, Billy? Can I talk to you for a second? Can we talk? I, I got to talk to you about it. We got – I'm like, yeah, let's go to my room. So <laughs> I'm going up. I don't know, eighth, ninth floor, not a word, right? You know? And we go in my room. like, yeah, come on. Let's talk. You know? So I go in my room. I'm like, man, I'm going to – these guys are gonna try to jack me up. It's gonna be. I'm gonna throw <laughs> kick these guys out the window. No, but uh, so but it was great. We sat on the bed. And we had a real long talk and all. And I'm like, you know, and it basically came down. Well, you know, he might have asked me. I heard some things, and I I just said if that was me, that's what I would do because that's pretty messed up, what it is. And and uh, it, it was it was real tense. Yeah, it was a good forty minute conversation. But at the end, you know, we all shook hands, hugged, and he's like, "You're a good guy. Go keep getting your books out. You're a good guy." And, you know, I'm like, this will blow over. You guys are like family. I said, you know, from what I've seen and hanging out with you guys, you know, you guys are all like brothers and, you know, brothers fight. You get in arguments, yep. but, you know, you got you to gotta be cool about things. You got to think some things through. You know, you're very public figures. And if it gets out there, everyone's going to know. But, again, imagine it was now with social media and stuff like that. If um, some of the drama that, that was going on back in the day, yeah. forget it. Yeah, when they, when they approached you, were you were they like snapping like this when they came up to you? Yeah, like a, I was like, the, I was like, the Billy, like, we like, need to talk. They were like, <laughs> like, we got to talk. Oh, then they strapped oh, their wrists together, and pulled out their knives. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, na, 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 boy. 
Boom. And Rob's on the bed, uh, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that dude dancing on the bed. Oh, gee. That's too <laughs> good. Oh, no. no, but it was like, it, it, it was were you like, wearing that sweater? Because maybe like, that's what they want to talk about. <laughs> Dude, this is it's hockey season, man. This is my Islander ugly sweater celebrating our victory over the Rangers yesterday. Hey, and wear it while we can still have hockey. That's, that's, that's right. the way I'm yeah, looking I, at for it. A few weeks, man. You ran uh, off. You ran off Dan. Oh. No, he's right there. Okay, I had to pick my nose, man. Speaking oh. of that time, if I can, if I if I can go back, I know I built this up right, but I Dan. So Niall uh, did uh, show me where I can get a thing that can, di you know, where I or something to digitize videos. You know, I got all these videotapes, right, Bo? You got them. It's that nope. time. So this is just uh, this is a show, and 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 Dan, I was, and I just saw this yesterday because I'm downloading. Dozens yeah. of did it. It's Talking Comics number number fifty eight. Okay. And the date of this is five three ninety five. Oh man! And it's uh, Craig Upton. These guys are uh, out of Boston, and, yeah. uh, and uh, they got wicked accents, and they're reviewing books. I'd be I if that was you said May of ninety five. Yeah, that is the date. I, I was I, I was twenty one, almost twenty two. Well, if I if I could share the screen, I could show that they're reviewing. I don't know Black Flag number five or something like that. Crazy. I, that is what exactly. happened. Share yeah. the screen with audio. Yeah, that's the exact day I graduated high school. I'm not joking. Shut the front door. I kid you not. All right, well, let's play this. Hang you on. You graduated high school then? Yeah. Ninety five. Sure. I graduated I, fifth grade. Class, class I'm, talking, I'm, I'm talking. You know what's funny right? about that spawn right there in your background? That is uh, Rob Liefeld pencils with Todd McFarlane inks. <laughs> oh, that is the beast image. Yeah. All right, so if I play this, let's see. It's 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 gonna. He's gonna talk about something else, but you hear their accents, and then they're talking about you talking smack about Jim Lee. Oh, oh yeah. So, here we go. Hang on out this week four great ones one that's just for that and it's the first image title they've actually dropped um we've got backlash number seven leading the path wow cool vibrant blue colors yeah. what the, what a backlash yeah brett booth some good stuff well brett booth's awesome yeah brett yeah. booth was awesome okay he's, here we go. he's even right. better now he's incredible yeah. your book is not the book they dropped they dropped i'm not gonna play the whole thing but they dropped grew but uh here we go Story done by Sean Ruffner, Jeff Marriott, and Brett Booth. And the item this was done by Brett Booth, Dan Norton, and Melvin Ruby. Very, very blue. They vary, like four or five pages each one. We had a variant cover for this book. That's right, Black Flag number four. Uh, the variant is only the blue. Ooh. You see the black outline, and the other book is white. So <laughs> don't go get it off. I gotta get it. Uh, story and art by Dan Fragger. And in this book, Dan takes a cheap shot at Jim Lee. Cheap Good. shot. Cheap shot at Jim Lee. Cheap shot. Cheap yeah, shot. I, I remember. I remember what this was about. There was, um, there was a. Uh, do you remember Joe Duffy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Joe Duffy, uh, she was doing some work at Extreme on on a book called uh, uh, Glory, <laughs> and she was expressing how upset she was that Gen Thirteen was a uh, which in her mind was a complete ripoff of this Japanese manga called Nest Robber. Oh. And Nest Robber were about these kids who had powers and the government scooped them up and trained them and basically uh it was, you know, Gen 13 as a manga before Gen 13. And I I got so upset that this uh that that this book that I love Gen 13 was actually, you know, Okay, baby, uh, <laughs> was a was a uh, a ripoff, you know that I I wasn't gonna let it stand. So yeah. of course, in my book, in the backgrounds, I was calling Jim Lee a crook, and you know, all these other things. <laughs> Twenty one year old, full yeah, of fire, right, and pissing yeah. vinegar. Yeah. Well, he's talking about Don, Dan Fraga talking smack. So hang on, here we go. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. He writes this letter saying. Um, Bitching about the entire Gen 13 covers and stuff. And it's just like he's, he's screaming and yelling, saying, 13 covers, 13 sales. Oh, Not a rip off, you know. Here he and is. And all of that set. And then at the end, he starts picking on the Wildcats Adventure. So I don't know. A little dissension in the ranks. <laughs> no, he's he's, that he's that talking to yeah, that guy. Yeah, next up we got Jeff number 15. <laughs> <laughs> Story by Ben and George. 
<laughs> Dang, Brian. The, the internet before is the internet. Man. Yeah, I was talking shit. I thought 13 covers was overkill. I remember thinking that, uh, you know, that I thought that he was going to talk about the nest robber thing. But hey, hey, what up, SDA? But yeah, no, I, I remember thinking like one variant cover. That's cool. But 13, like that's a like I thought it was. Uh, and th you got to understand. When we were in the studios, Bo remembers this aspect of it. We're very competitive, right? And we 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 were always getting the numbers, and we'd look at numbers, and <laughs> and really? you know, oh yeah, oh, we were yeah. like oh. always looking at the numbers, and and I felt like you know that's a cheap move, man. Like 13, 13 covers. That means for every one person that's a hardcore fan, they're gonna buy thirteen, and that's not a real number. And I was like upset about it, you know. It's the passion. Now it's the, like it's, 50. It's, yeah. Oh, we used to get, I remember when the fax machine, the numbers would come in mm -hmm. and I would get them nine times out of 10, I would get them earlier than anybody. And cause I'd get them straight from the distributors and stuff. And Todd at one point goes, bud, you know, if we, if spawn ever gets to a hundred thousand, we're canceling the book because back then <laughs> books were selling 500,000 every yeah. month, you know, yeah. especially spawn and stuff. But he would think we could. Ne I could never live with Spawn. No people knowing it's a hundred thousand. And wow. <laughs> well, at the same time at, at DC Comics, I was doing Guy Gardner Warrior monthly. I, I was I had a two and a half year run on that book. Oh, and yeah. the reason I got the book was because they were getting ready to cancel it. And Kevin Dooley and Eddie Berganza were the editors on it. And they go, well, you know, Bo's. Well, let's give it to Bo. You know, he's. Chuck Dixon had, was leaving. He was going, yeah, Bo would be a good choice to, to pick it up because they figured it's going to go two or three issues and that Bo gets to do the comic and get a paycheck and we get this, you know, we don't care. They gave me total freedom. And that book was being going to be canceled. I ended up running it for two and a half years. But it was canceled because the numbers were at 60,000. Wow. That, it wow. Was, those were too low. So – at that time period, I mean, that was a, you know, that was a big deal. That was, uh, and I just, gee, I remember those numbers used to come in on those early image books. They were mind boggling. I mean, you can imagine what the checks would have looked like on them, but the sales were just, I think about it now, it was just crazy. I mean, it was a nutty, and I'd come from Eclipse when, you know, we were dancing. If we sold 30,000 or something, we were all doing a dance, but, uh, this went well beyond that. It was a, it was a neat thing. And you know, Dan, somewhere here at the house, I've got our sales numbers from the Berserkers, all mm. you know the issues and stuff. I, well, if I dig those up, I'll have to send them to you because hey, we were kings. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wonder what we, those would be like uh, considered nowadays. It'd be like the number one book. Oh yeah, yeah. By <laughs> you know when when um, Black Flag number one, the very first black and white issue. I, I know that number really well. It did 83,000 copies, you know, <laughs> uh, you just go, man, what, what I wouldn't do for a number like that, you know? Oh, hundred percent. Those were the data. Yeah. percent. I gotta say, of all the comics, of all the comics I've done, and I remember this, probably the lowest selling book I ever did. The numbers came in. I mean, everything was, was probably about 1500. I mean, we're talking. This, we're not talking about some obscure, you know, small publishing thing. We're talking about from mid-major publisher and stuff. Remember those numbers came in, and I went, "There's got to be a mistake. There's got to be something missing here from it." But no, it wasn't a mistake. And oh gosh, I mean, I felt bad to the point where I was I said, "Well, I got paid thirty-five dollars a page to do that. Maybe I should give thirty of that back." You know? No, oh, but, shit. But, but I did. That's not on you, man. That's not on you. You uh, did the work. No, yeah, but just you know, back then, that to come in that low was just. Oh, hey, man, geez. don't don't say that. My my book, The Grave, over at IDW, fourteen hundred. Oh, hey. no. you know, different. But this was during the big, t you know. The grave was awesome. Is that still counting the Amazon numbers too? No, that that that's the thing. I and I bought I bought I bought the grave back. By the way, so I I I got yeah. uh, a total of nineteen hundred were printed, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sitting on five hundred 
500 of them. I just bought the, I bought all of the back stock. I have 500 of them. No. Hey. I'm, I'm going to sit on those bad boys. I'm sitting on, I'm sitting on gold, baby. Get him, man. <laughs> wow. Oh, so, man. Dan, uh, going back to, to, the, to the time, talking to the image days, what was a day like at, say, Extreme Studios? Like, what time did you get to work? What time did you leave? Did you guys all go to lunch together? Like, what was it like, the atmosphere? Uh, it was very clicky. It was a lot like high school. You know, everybody got in at different times. People were working at different times. The color, the color department was going 24 hours a day. They worked mm -hmm. in shifts. Mm -hmm. I usually would get in around 9, uh, having had breakfast at home. Uh, then, you know, we'd click up and go to lunch. Sometimes, you know, I'd go to... I go to lunch with uh, Matt Hawkins, Eric Stevenson, and Rob a lot of the time. Larry Martyr, Larry Martyr would tag along. It was either El Pollo Loco or Taco Bell most Taco of the time. Taco Bell, that's and, where I uh, went. You know, we, we. I went with you all in Rob's Jeep that I think he still has. He still does. Yeah, yeah. love yeah. that Jeep. It's a <laughs> that's an artifact of awesomeness. Oh, no, um, uh, we'd go have lunch. We'd talk comics. If it was a comic day, we'd go to one or two, maybe sometimes three comic shops, uh, visit with a retailer, uh, buy new buy new books, uh, come back, do some more drawing. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there was always some sort of horseplay, whether it was, you know, um, karate fights or, or, <laughs> uh, or you know, nerf darts, ner you know, um, there was always some sort of drama of some sort too, because when you get, you know, 30 people in, in a bullpen, uh, not everybody's going to agree all the time. So there was a bit of that happening. Um, we would whenever we'd go to a, like a movie premiere, we'd kind of go in mass. I remember seeing Jurassic park with like the whole studio. Wow. Um, you know, uh, did you go to premiere for Jurassic Park? Were you no, guys no. The, we the, we did get to go. The I got to uh, go to two premieres with Rob. Um, I went to the the Batman and Robin one, mm -hmm. and went to True Lies, the the oh, okay. Arnold Schwarzenegger True Lies. Yeah. True Lies. That's uh, awesome. But no, we had we had the Cinerama Dome that was over by the studio. Like that was the other thing that was really cool. Um, is the stadium that was next door to Extreme hosted the the Angels and the Rams, and then we had the the, um, the I don't ducks. know what they call them now the Ducks across the yeah, way at the pond. Ducks. But yeah. but when we'd want to catch like a Rams game, we would just go underneath the chain link fence because uh, <laughs> Extreme and um, the stadium parking lot shared a fence. So we would go under the fence and just walk over and buy the, the cheap seats and go watch a football game. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah, that's it was cool, a lot man. of fun. That's awesome. Good times, man. I, like, yeah. And, and yeah. also there's a lot of, lot of uh, pot smoking too. Uh, <laughs> a lot of pot smoking. Like, um, you know, some of us, we'd go out to the parking lot and just get, get lit up. Reef rack. No, reef racks. Look at this. Yeah. Wait, our ass. Didn't the studio go to see The Crow together, Dan? I'm pretty sure we did. Pretty sure we did. We went and saw a lot of movies together. Hey, did Rob buy you guys lunch every time you guys went out? No. Oh, no. man. I got to take a lesson from him. The, we would yeah, go to the, like Pizzeria Uno and... Yeah, there were times... Nice there, buying him lunch every couple of like days. If we have... Uh, uh, where was the clicking coming from? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty Mo. sure when... I'm pretty sure when Mo moved out of the way, it looks like it's his... Uh, his fan wires clanging against each other. Who? Mm -hmm. Oh, what I do? No, no, you didn't do anything. I think that uh, I think maybe it might be picking up your fan blade wires oh. clicking against each other. Hold on. Oh, that's what it is. There you go. Oh, like the yeah, little part. Moved, yeah, he moved thing. just for a second. I saw him clanging. <laughs> that's nah, awesome. Well, well, that's all right. We're not going to be on that much longer. But yeah. but yeah, the uh, the. <laughs> when we'd have like big sessions, like we'd have these brainstorms. There was this place called um, Hoff's Hut. It's now it's called Lucille's, but it was called Hoff's Hut. And we would go up, uh, and it would be a lot of the, a lot of the studio. Like I, I wouldn't go as far as calling us a brain trust, but a lot of the the, the guys would go up, and w whenever we had like a crossover event, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we would we would chop it up and talk about wouldn't it be cool if and what if this and 
that sort of stuff. And Rob would, Rob would foot the bill on those sort of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's neat. So do you guys now, do you guys actually, do you stay in touch with Todd at all? Like Bo, do you still have contact I, with him or no? I talk more with his wife, Wanda, uh, mm-hmm. than yeah, I've, to be real honest with you, Todd and I probably have, Oh gosh, Beth talked to him at San Diego last year. She ran into him and they, they, they talked, but I haven't seen him. Oh hell. I haven't seen him in person. Oh shit. 10 years. Wow. Really? Probably, yeah. I haven't seen him in person in 10 years and cause our schedules are just opposite. And then I haven't mm-hmm. talked to him. It's probably been that long since we've talked on the phone. I'd say. Now Wanda, oh, wow. yeah, I keep up with Wanda, but uh, yeah, no, no, that's, yeah, I that's, that's, to... you know, how many people do you continue to talk with that you worked with or for, you know, decades later too? I mean, yeah. you're just it's just a business schedule. I yeah. talk to yeah. Billy every day because he has no friends. That's um, true. Yeah, yeah, I feel bad for him. Hey, Bo, did you actually see the documentary? <laughs> no, not yet. No, I haven't seen it yet. I thought it was done pretty well. I'm it's, anxious to see it. My buddy Chenzi produced that documentary. Oh yeah. man, it was. Yeah. Well, we will, what, are gonna have um. So yeah. the director David, David Oster. David, he's, gonna, yeah, good guy. he's coming on Monday night nine. Awesome. Yeah, David's awesome. Yeah. I look forward to it. I look uh, forward to but it. But I I still talk. I talk with uh, Liefeld probably once a month. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes through text. Todd, about once a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I talk, you know, I talk with Wanda on Facebook, uh, like, like Bo, like maybe, um, once every couple months, mm-hmm. you know, just chit chat and it's never business. It's just chit chat. Um, my friend, Brian Murray, who used to do Supreme, I talked to him, mm-hmm. uh, often, um, Danny Mickey, I talked to maybe <laughs> a couple, couple, you know, like maybe, uh, once every three or four months. I, I, I pretty much stay in touch with a lot of those guys. And I mean, cause Facebook is what up flipping uh, the, the Facebook, you know, Facebook is one of those things, Yeah, you know, that, that, that is on there. And of course, Marat, you know, Marat, I, I, you know, talk with him probably once or twice a month on Facebook as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Marat's a good dude. I like him. He's a very good dude. Yeah. And very smart. You guys lived through, uh, you guys experienced it firsthand. What a great, what a great time, you know? Yeah. In comics, Please. you know, personally, I don't think that'll ever happen again. And you know, not that I was a part of Image, but I was doing my own book too. And just, uh, how- dude, you when you came out, you were like, you were an anomaly. You know, you were you had image like heat coming out of one guy. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it, it was a, uh, it was a very cool thing to watch. Uh, I wasn't one of the guys you guys hated, were I? Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> no, Billy. Uh, and if it, if time just would have been altered just a little bit, um, I could have seen you as as one of the image owners in that time. Because, like Rob, like Todd, you have the charisma. I mean, mm-hmm. regardless, no matter what business, if you would have ended up, you know, making shoes or whatever the selling cards were, you've got the charisma that that carries. So you would have, you know, you would have fit in. I like yeah, I like them all, you know. Oh, I mean, no, it was something they wanted me to. That was them having me come in and stuff like that in like '96 or '97, and then one of the guys like, yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Valentino called me. He's like, nah. That the thing is, is everyone has to agree on it. Yeah, and they were yeah, they were like, stiff ah, about oh, that. You know, but, you, but you understand what I mean. You've yeah. you've got you know, of course, the talent, but you've got the charisma because that's one thing. You know, people ask occasionally, how do I write? How do I get into the business of comics? Blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. But I always tell all the creators, this is before or want to be or aspiring is this is before the, the Internet is what it is. You've got to promote yourself these days. You have to. Yeah. Uh, by these days, I mean the last 15 years. You should always do it. You have to have your own persona. You have to be able to market yourself you cannot and and believe it or not uh, yeah i'm i'm an introvert i just turn the volume up but would i rather have my handful of friends yes in a way i would but you you can't do that now you have Mm -hmm. to market your i was lucky enough when i got in the business in the mid 80s 
No one else in comics talked like I did. Um, seriously, no. everyone was either from California twang? or the New twang? York. It's that semi-south <laughs> mangling yeah. of words. So I stood out. Um, on the business end, when I got into comics, it was being run by former hippies. And, and I'm not being mm -hmm. derogatory. That It was guys that used to have underground shops, this, that, and the other. They all had you know, hair down to their back. They wore T-shirts. and When I would do the retail and dis distribution seminars and stuff, uh, shirt and tie. I, I mean, remember you know, those whole, days, Bo. The suspenders, the whole, <laughs> because that set me apart. So yeah. you had this guy in suspenders and a tie who talked like a hillbilly, and you're going, what the hell is this about? I got to listen to this guy, if nothing else, just to find out what the, is his deal. And <laughs> But it worked. It, it, yeah, it, it, I didn't lie. I didn't change. I didn't act. I just turned the volume up a little bit to what I was. And mm. uh, you've got to do that as a creator. You have to, you have to, I can't stress how important, unless you are just an artist and born to be able to draw perfectly, then you can be quiet, not say anything and the work will do it. But, uh, it's, I can't, I, if anything comes out of this, I stress that if you want to be something, you got to push yourself. You really do. Yeah. That, Brian Dunham says Billy's double page ad for she number one in previews was the mic drop heard around the world. Yeah, that was fun. Well, I had to do it, man. I had to act like I was somebody, and I was doing it out of my one-bedroom apartment where I was six up, how to draw my comics. What up, Clayton? And, uh, you know, I had Debbie sign it as the marketing director for Crusade yeah. Comics, this new comic company out of New York City, even though we're, at, you know, we're in Queens. And I'm uh, doing this out of my one-bedroom apartment. And, uh, like, wow, this may be a new comic company. This And, you know. Who knows? Crazy, right? No, man. You don't did it, man. But the thing, too, is that we were all like, even back then, and, you know, you said there was some drama and stuff, but we were all just just uh, immovable bundles of positive energy. You know, it was just like a tsunami of it. It just was and, – and you got to stay like that today, you know? Both of you guys yeah. do that. You know, Dan, especially you. You know, you're getting cannons from all sides lately and all, and me, too. I got some stuff. You got to stay positive. It's about the books. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's about your vision. If you like me, you know, like Kelly Sue DeConnick said, hey, you don't like me, then don't buy my books. You well, know, like you said, you, you know, it's, you uh, like you know, people books, assume, but... right? People assume stuff, Billy. And, uh, you know what they say about assumptions. I do. I do. But we don't have time for that. They're not on no. the radar. We're on the radar no. to do something great. Yeah, man. I think for me, it's, it's about, um, bringing, bringing the heat to the fans, you yeah. know? Because there's that hunger. You know, I've got a spinner rack back here, and it's got stuff on it that still gets me jonesed up. Mm -hmm. And, like, to me, my mission every time I put uh, pencil to paper is to recreate or create my own version of that kind of magic because yeah. I feel like it's it's lacking out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what was so great about the, the – Thank the, you, TJ. Appreciate like, that. Like, Thank you, TJ. Like the like the the like hell I will. The you know the Tom McFarland story. It's just so inspiring, and you see all the all the trials and tribulations he went through. But yeah. it captures that time, you know, when he first broke in, and you see how he's able to move from book to book to book, mm -hmm. and you know that he met haters every step of the way. Yeah, and he's like, this is what I want to do. I'm tell if you want to if you want to do this with me, let's do it because it's going to be great. It, it's. It, I just found it so inspiring, and and to this day, he's still an inspiration. He really is. It was. A, it was a great documentary for sure. I, I mean, it made it got me hyped. And yeah. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I love all the uh, <laughs> McFarland documentaries. You guys, you guys ever see this one? Yep. No. Yeah. This this one came out in um, I think 2002. 2002. Two. Yeah. Yeah, 2002. This one's pretty good. It covers. I've got spirit. it on VHS tape as well. Yeah. <laughs> VHS. I'm serious. What's that? Would you, like, would you like Billy to digitize that for you? <laughs> Send me a truckload of all your uh, VHS tape. I can only imagine how many you got. <laughs> um, Bo, hey, 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 before you, Dan, just to let you know, we were talking about who we still keep in contact with and stuff from those days. Yeah. Now, because I was on the business end stuff, Tony. Rana, Teresa, yeah. Kenny, Doug. I we all meet once a year at San Diego every year. Wow. We always have lunch and dinner, you know, at, at there. 
and yeah. I keep up with them all through the year, you know, every day, every week. Oh. So that's who I worked with in the office at the, you know, at the time, all yeah. the time. So of I course. keep up with them. Constantly. Please say hello. So, Please say oh, hello. To definitely them. will. They will, they will, they will love. Wow. That's been forever. I haven't, I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't thought about them in a long time. No, awesome. no, I definitely will we'll get a kick out of that. And right. again, some of the nicest, as Dan can attest, some of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. Bo, I think this is a great thing to end it with because we're coming. Oh, on. gee, man, two oh, hours. That was that was um, the debate between Todd and Peter David, um, Philadelphia, I believe it was. Weren't there and, a couple? Wasn't there like chicken suit and then the no shirt? Yeah, this was the, <laughs> the, the one I was there worked for Todd and helped him with. Uh, helped him with. Don't do it. They're not. They're not. They're serious. Because Todd was going, this will be fun. Then we'll have a good time. We'll get up there and we'll do this. You know, he, but he didn't know Peter was serious about this. Yeah, yeah, mean, notes and shit. And and the I, debate I, yeah. was about art or writers or story. What's more yeah, important, right? But it it was it was you know I you know and I get along with Peter fine. You know all these mm -hmm. years and stuff. But I kept telling Todd, I said, this is not going to be a, they're not looking at this as a fun thing. Peter had a group. He had Harlan Nelson and a bunch of other people helping him, you know, well, we'll go this. I mean, they had strategic and, and they were smart about it. And I, Todd, don't, don't, please don't do this. But no, he was going, no, nah, this will be fun. This will be a good time. And he went into it with um, naive, you know, he was going to have fun with his peers in comics and do this, but it did not go that way and it was like you know <laughs> it was a circus man yeah uh, was, you could uh, it's on youtube isn't it like you could yeah. still go and watch it? It. Oh, okay you todd's know, got his, his necklace on he's didn't he cut no he came out like in boxing shorts or some shit yeah. you know dun, 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 dun. <laughs> he was having fun he was there yeah. to have fun and and they were uh you know well, the funny thing is, is that when comics were were more art centric, <laughs> say than than writing centric, you look at the numbers when they're more art centric compared to when the art is secondary for the for for the most part. A lot of comics, especially the mainstream yeah. books, yeah. a lot of them, it's like, who the hell hired this person? I would I would be embarrassed. To, this would even I wouldn't even mm -hmm. submit this as a portfolio piece. And you see the yes. numbers; the numbers aren't good. <laughs> you know, people want excitement; they want fun. Yeah. So, King Crusher. What's this, Bo? What? Bo Smith. King King oh, my gosh. We did, before the internet and everything, it started out, I did Comic Cast. And this is before I was in the industry. Me and some of you out there may know of Clint McElroy. Clint McElroy and his sons do a podcast called My Brother, My Brother, and Me, and another one called The Adventure Zone. They are New York Times bestseller graphic novels. The show is sells out everywhere. I mean, it's monstrous and it's huge. Well, Clint was a local DJ here in town. We went to college together. There was me and Chuck Minsker, who was the producer at a TV thing. We did audio cassettes, a comic cast where we interviewed via phone. And if we went to a convention, comic book creators, this is way early eighties, maybe even seventies, but then it, it, Went from that, and we sold it to the distributors. I mean, Bud Plant, Diamond, everybody, they sold these cassettes. Then we did videos called Comic Cast. Before Comic Cast, we were Comic Cast. And in between, I did these for Eclipse for the uh, retailer and distributor meetings that they would have. And I'm trying to wrap this up real quick, guys. Um, I would give, just like an anchor, Eclipse Comics this month is coming out with, and I would show art, and I would do this serious thing. And in between, we'd have these adventures of Bo LeDuc, real man. And <laughs> there would be these things where I would fight gorillas and throw them off rooftops. I would fight an Elvis impersonator. We'd go through these skit things. Well, those are all, all those skits are on YouTube. And that's what he put up the thing to. So it's, I got to get this. You, you go on YouTube and type in Bo LeDuc, L-A-D-U-K-E, they'll show up. And they're very, and I was, that was back when I was toting about 195, had the, uh, oh gosh, they're embarrassing as hell, but they're fun. You know, mm -hmm. I laugh at myself on the scene, but you think about it now, 
there's Clint, who is this, I mean, that Lynn Miranda, who does Hamilton, is one of his mm -hmm. biggest fans that comes to his shows. Jimmy Buffett's one of his biggest fans, comes to the shows. And here he is going, that's right, I'm Elvis, and I'm from Kmart. You want to fight <laughs> with me, LaDuke? I mean, it's some. I'm Weird. watching some of it right now, Bo. Oh, you look no. great in a in a big ass hat with them sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fighting fighting Elvis. I get thrown out of a truck. All oh, that, uh, that that's what that is. So there's three of them, and they're. And they're then you fine. show off Scout. Oh yeah, I, Tim yeah, Truman Scout. Oh, this, oh <laughs> nightmare so, upon nightmare. So, so when can we expect the next next Winona Earp comic? Um, hopefully the pandemic. Or the pandemic, as I call it, kind of uh, you know threw a wrench into everything just because of planning and stuff. That's all through IDW, and I'm sure we're going to do another one, and I'm sure it'll probably be a Kickstarter as well, or you know one of the crowdfunding things. Uh, Tim and I already got the book half done. Tim Rosan and I, nice. And uh, so that's done. And I got two new books coming out from Clover Press from Ted Adams and Robbie Robbins, who we're co-founders of IDW and they've got Clover Press. So I've got two books coming out and one of them I'm co-writing with Melanie Scrofano. It's a thing that we've both created. So mm -hmm. getting to, um, you know, share my vast wealth of comic book knowledge. So yeah, and I'm seeing a lot of talk about Winona Earp season four. on Season uh, four. Yeah. We, we trended globally number two on Twitter. Awesome. Like that. Now, if, if I can translate that into comic book sales and viewer <laughs> ratings, I would be very happy. But, you know, season four is off to a bang. It was, um, it was amazing. Um, again, think about this stuff. I'm 65 years old. This stuff happened for if For that to happen this late in someone's career is unheard of. I never would have believed in it to think you have a property. It goes to show you anybody never quit. Never stop because you never know. Mm -hmm. How are you 65, Bo? I don't get it. Oh, the, the super soldier serum. Let me tell you. Uh, no. yeah, <laughs> you're getting better looking and like no. you get more fit. I, got I don't know how you do it. I you look younger now years. than you do in that, that when you're fighting Elvis. That is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, that was during uh, the days, you know, the image days you go out, eat a big six pound steak, lay in my hotel room, not do shit. So <laughs> now I got I got healthier as the as years ago went by. So I, there's other people I haven't tormented. I got to stick around a little longer. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> Continue so, sharing uh, that vast knowledge. Oh gosh, I got to keep some of that stuff to myself to have a job. <laughs> That's it, brother. And Dan, you're uh, you're kicking ass, huh? Black flag. I saw someone yeah. posted, We're near right it. there. Nearing 175,000. Uh, be, uh, bringing out a special uh, variant Man. cover here pretty soon, and uh, working away on it. We we plan on on fulfilling this fall, and uh, then campaigning for the second issue right after that. Nice, nice. So we're we're doing great. Uh, very very grateful to uh, be able to live the life. You know, take care of my family, take care of uh, the fans, and be yep. able to draw the book I want to draw the way I want to draw it. It's an right, absolute Absolutely. perfect situation. Every yeah, bit of it earned. That's for Every sure. Bit. Just, Every damn just bit. imagine what you'll be doing when you're 65, Dan. You've got that much, you know, that's good. Yeah. Well, my, my, youngest, my youngest will be uh, 18 years old when I'm 65. That's I have a one-year-old, guys. So, Dang, bro. Yeah. Man alive. So buy his, everyone buy, buy uh, Black Flag Pineapple Perception. Yeah, it's about it's about flags. It's about flags, frags, and friendships. And friendship. And friendship. There you hey, go. There you go. <laughs> hey, here's, a, here's the bumper sticker right here. Damn. I back Excellent. it. Proudly Look back. Look at that. Look, Look at that. that. It's gorgeous. awesome. Gorgeous. It's awesome with capital R. Oh, no, you I like that. Oh, I like that a lot, Bill. I like it a lot. <laughs> and uh, I've been saying... Denham you. says congratulations. Thank Don. you. Thank you, Art. These are some, some of my old studio comrades, Art and Brian. Yeah. Brian yeah. is the one. Brian Denham, it's so We should funny. do an extreme studio show, Billy. Oh, yeah, we definitely God. should. So, Let's Brian do it. Denham, Brian Denham is the guy yeah, that, Rob, that drew it. the uh, Alan Moore Bad Rock Violator. And that was the oh. very first time I had seen an Alan Moore script. 
And I remember page or panel one, page, 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 page going, I'm glad I'm not you. Uh, <laughs> Dan, we, we have to have Brian on. We have to have an Extreme Studios uh, reunion. I'm going to start working on it. I'm going to start working on it. Dan, let's get it together. Let's do it. Be Brian, excellent. But Brian can't wear that hat. No shit. No Red Sox Oh, hat. come on, guys. Drop Not the extreme. hat. Let him wear it. Extreme. And, and uh, if I may say, uh, I'm 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 all we're we're having a lot of fun with she. I just did a whole bunch of more sketch covers. I got to do a hundred of these. But uh, we just we just shipped a whole bunch of books out today. Um, be it for those you got sketch covers, they're all here. Here's another one. Oh, Beautiful. Okay. So that's yeah. what I've been doing. Uh, I like the red out. eye variant. What's what's that? A big eye. Yeah, the red eye, the red, red eye, eye variant. variant. Yeah, where you uh, she used to have the the circle on her eye. That's I did. Right. But that's yeah. so funny because I posted that 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 drawing's like this big. I drew it on a little piece of paper, yeah. and uh, I was at a, a we had a, a little launch party with these partners I'm going to have, and I ended up being charlatans and all. It never worked out. But yeah. I met Neil Hansen there. Neil Hansen was at Comic Buyers Guide at the time, I think, or Comic Values Monthly. Remember Neil Hansen? Do you remember Comic ba Buyers Monthly, Bo? Sure. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so Neil saw the art, had all the art for the first issue. He's like, I love this. But he goes, you know what? Drop the circle. Wow. Like, well, don't you get the circle? It's like a chap. He's like, yeah, you don't need it. Look how beautiful that face would be without it. And I'm like, oh, man, you're right. And I, I remember I raced it because it was in pencil form. I, it wasn't ink. The circle wasn't ink because it was going to be colored. And, yeah. uh, and thank God I did. <laughs> he's like, what do you need it for? Look how beautiful this face is. A nice mm. white kabuki face. Do that. So hey, I want to say, I just uh, saw in the chat, Keaton Smith, that you had popped it up. I just wanted to thank him. He's a, a awesome backer on Black Flag. So thank yeah, you very much, nice. Keaton. Appreciate that. There he is. More, not, more than words, man. And Mandy, right, too. we got Mandy in the, in the audience. Hello, Mandy. Good to see you. It's great seeing you. It Good luck with your book, yeah. right? Tonight, I guess it pop, it drops tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, we'll all be there. So, guys, oh. this is just so great. Um, yeah. really I'm great down to five percent on my iPad, Billy. All right. Well, I think we're gonna go, Niall. Uh, Watching it up. Yeah. So we'll if we get along, we have a great. We got a, a, continuing the cod the Todd Father talk. On Monday, you want to take one of yeah. So Monday, we're gonna have David Osteron, the director of uh, the uh, um, what's that? The documentary. Oh yeah, yeah no, I thought Bo was saying something. No, I was taking care of business, so something that's not important. No. Oh no worries, no worries. Yeah, so we've got David on to talk about the documentary that aired on was it Sci Fi Wire, um, which was just amazing. So we're gonna get down and dirty with that, plus all the other stuff that David's been a part of, like Avengers Endgame and Infinity War. Um, you know, he's been the assistant to uh, who was he assistant to? Ben Mr. Cumberbatch. Yes. And Anthony Mackey and a bunch of people. Yeah, so he has quite a career. Lot. He's got wow. quite the career, and I think this guy's heading in, in an amazing direction. So 9 p.m. Wow. Monday night, we're going to have him on, so everyone join us, uh, as well as a slew of other shows next week. We've got quite a few coming up that we're still getting finalized and decide who's going to be on what day. Yeah, we, gotta, we, gotta, we, gotta, we got out. some good guests coming up. We got Brian Pino coming up. We got Jimmy and Amanda coming up. Check this oh, out, cool. boys. I found amongst my videotapes San Diego Comic-Con 1996. Oh, wow. Bob <laughs> Camp? That bad boy with Jimmy and Amanda. Oh, oh, Bob oh. Camp coming up? Talking Ren and Stimpy? Yeah, it's going to be good. Good stuff. It's going to be fun, man. It's going to be well, fun. Thank, thank you both. We went Big shout out to the chat, our moderator, TJ James, Hero and Burr. It's good to see Lee Ditsworth in the house. Steph is coming. Zaid Comics. It's always great. SDA, thanks for joining. Uh, Brian Hero. Denham, thanks for popping in. If anyone's new to this channel, you know, please hit the subscribe button. You know, like, share. Uh, you know, we're about indie creators. Just, just We're just about creating, man. Escapism. Oh, yeah. Uh, we are just a fun place to just hang out, and that's what we're here to do. So if you like that kind of stuff, subscribe. Uh, check out Fragus channel. Um, if you want to plug that real quick, Dan. Yeah, actually, I got a brand new channel. Um, and don't forget your super chat. Uh, yeah, that's oh, we got a super chat. Yeah. Thank you, Fox. Fox so, Story. Uh, hey, Bo, you and Mitch's run on Warrior really got me writing and drawing. See, that, the ranch. that yes. I appreciate. That I appreciate. And we appreciate you, Fox Storytelling. Thank you so much for that. So I have a, a brand new channel. My old channel got nuked. 
uh, got false flagged and got nuked. So I lost my entire Couch Doodles channel that I've had since 2006. Oh, uh, so I started a brand new one uh, about two and a half weeks ago. It's simply called Frega Boom. If you go to youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Frega Boom, F R A G A B O O M, uh, you can find my channel. And on there, you can see the Todd McFarlane interview where he gives you amazing life lessons and, and lessons to succeed in comics and anything you want to do. So please check out the Frega Boom channel on YouTube. It's awesome. Dan, right. it was good seeing you, bud. Our you too, Bo. We got to keep staying in touch, man. Uh, I'm, I don't do anything. I'm an old man. I sit here. I, you're, I'm available anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. All, All, right, right, guys. All right, guys. Good to see you, boys. This Thank you. Thank Great you guys so much. Memory lane. Memory. Memory. All right, we going to take us out now? <laughs> I just wanted to just, <laughs> just absorbing this. You know, he wants to show. hear the singing and the songing. Well, I am the singing in the song, and ah, yeah, you are. Right, everyone, short Scala Land. That's what I'm. <laughs> Hell yeah! No, it's Annihilation, bro. It's my it's new. Not, I think yeah. Bo's. Uh, I think Bo's iPad. Bo is out. out. Yeah, All right, everyone, have a great night. We'll see you it's, Monday it's night, fading. nine p.m. It's, there it is. It's, it's going quick. He's fading. He's fading. All right, right everyone, we'll see you. Clothes, there's lots of world out there. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.